Trish L. Gleason, Assistant City Clerk, you are hereby directed to call a regular session of the City Council to be held on Tuesday, September 5th, 2023 at 6.30 p.m. in the historic Federal Building for the purpose of conducting such business that may properly come before the City Council. Good evening and welcome to a regular scheduled session of the Dubuque City Council for September 5th, 2023. As a reminder to our participants, you can provide in-person input or virtual audio or written input during the sections of the agenda where public input is accepted. Input options during the live meeting include in-person attendees may approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any public input regarding the items they would like to speak to. Remote, attendees can log into GoToMeeting using the login links, phone numbers, and access code that appear on, on the broadcast, live stream, and are posted on the front page of the meeting agenda. This option includes audio input and written chat input. If you are participating via computer, indicate which item you would like to speak to in the chat function or note that you would like to speak during the appropriate section. If you are participating via phone, indicate which item you would like to speak to during the appropriate section. All comments, whether in person or virtual, must include name and address. Additionally, written public input is accepted by contacting the City Council directly from the City's webpage at www.cityofdubuque.org slash council contacts and through the City Clerk's Office email at ctyclerk at cityofdubuque.org. This information will be reiterated during the meeting. Attendance at tonight's meeting is as follows. Mayor Cavanaugh? Here. Council members Farber? Here. Jones? Here. Resnick? Here. Roussel? Here. Sprank? Here. Wethel? Here. City Manager Van Milligan? Here. City Attorney Brumwell? Here. Thank you, Mayor Cavanaugh, and I'll turn it over to you for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Trish. I invite all who are able to please rise and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First on tonight's agenda are proclamations. Our first proclamation is uh, Nathaniel and Charlotte Morgan Peace Week. Thank you, Trish. And I believe we have Ernestine Moss and Chris Hap Olson and Brian Halstos here to accept this proclamation. And anyone else who would like to come up. So come on up. Yeah, come up to the podium. If you'd like to say a few words before I read the proclamation, feel free. Thank you for inviting us. And I want to thank the council and thank the city for taking this, giving us this opportunity and honoring this couple, native Dubuquers that were original Dubuquers that were a disaster that had happened to them, but we're trying to rebuild and show that there's unity in our community. And so um, this is important for us for, to be recognized to recognize them and to recognize our community, saying that we are a place to live and everyone can feel welcome here. Thank you. And maybe just quickly, you'll, you'll mention this in the proclamation, but everyone here and, and in the public is welcome to join us tomorrow for a memorial service at the Shalom Spirituality Center at 7 p.m. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for being here to accept this proclamation. Looking forward to uh, attending the service with you tomorrow evening. City of Dubuque Proclamation. Whereas the City of Dubuque has committed to uncovering the history of all Dubuqueers through the Black Heritage Survey in an effort to tell more, a more complete story of Dubuque. And whereas Nathaniel and Charlotte Morgan were among the pioneers of Dubuque and contributed to its growth by working hard, purchasing the first plot, platted lot, lot one, owning a home, supporting the construction of Dubuque's first church, and preserving in the, persevering in the face of racism as African Americans in a community that practiced slavery. 
And whereas the lynching of Nathaniel Morgan and the subsequent pardoning of the lynchers shattered the potential for inter interracial unity and peace by fueling white supremacy. And whereas members of the Nash Nathaniel Morgan Memorial Committee believe that confronting our past injustice leads to learning, teaching, and building an equitable and diverse community. And whereas Dubuqueers increasingly make a concerted effort in the face of ignorance, indifference, and racism to build an equitable and diverse community that honors the faith, aspirations, and perseverance of our earliest black residents. And whereas the Nathaniel Morgan Memorial Committee and other Dubuque residents maintain that in life, Nathaniel and Charlotte Morgan represented the promise of a unified and peaceful interracial community. And whereas the Nathaniel Morgan Memorial Committee will celebrate this rekindled promise of unity and peace in a public memorial service on September 6th at 7 p.m. in the Shalom Spirituality, Spirituality Center Chapel. Now therefore I, Brad M. Cavanaugh, Mayor of the City of Dubuque, Iowa, on behalf of the City Council staff and residents of Dubuque, do hereby proclaim the first week of September as Nathaniel and Charlotte Morgan Peace Week. Our second proclamation is Days of Peace. Thank you. Now that you started the trend, you can clap for everyone. <laughs> okay, our second proclamation is Days of Peace and Nonviolence, September 6th to, to October 1st. Thank you, Trish. I believe R.S. Stewart is here to accept this proclamation. Yes, uh, thank you for having someone from the International Day of Peace um, every year since 2010. Um, our kickoff event is the event happening uh, tomorrow night, uh, September 6th, the memorial service to Charlotte and Nathaniel Morgan. And the closing event is the Dubuque People's Housing Forum on October 1st, sponsored by Iowa Citizens for Community Improvement and taking place at St. Luke's United Methodist Church. So I could actually ask the entire um, chamber to stand up right now. Um, but in the middle of those two events on October 6th, I mean on, on September 6th and October 1st, is the International Day of Peace itself on September 21st, uh, which is the day recognized by the United Nations. And that's when we have our keynote speech at Loris College. Uh, so thank you again, and without further ado, I'll let you read the proclamation. Thank you very much, RS, for being here to accept this proclamation. City of Dubuque Proclamation. Whereas the issue of peace embraces the deepest hopes of all peoples and remains humanity's guiding inspiration, in 1981, the United Nations proclaimed the International Day of Peace to be devoted to commemorating and strengthening the ideals of peace both within and among all nations and peoples. And whereas the United Nations expanded the observance of the International Day of Peace in 2001 to include the call for a day of global ceasefire and nonviolence, and invited all nations and people to honor a cessation of hostilities for the duration of the Day of Peace. And whereas there is growing support within our nation for the observance of the International Day of Peace, including a group of Dubuque area residents inviting all to create a culture of peace by participating in a citywide celebration from Wednesday, September 6th to Sunday, October 1st. And whereas local and global violence impels all citizens to work toward converting humanity's noblest aspirations for world peace into a practical reality. It is possible to see our community and world turn from violent to nonviolent solutions within our lifetimes. And whereas the Dubuque Day of Peace Organizing Committee's 2023 focus will be making peace in our polarized society. With an in-person and virtual keynote presentation by Professor Dr. Peter T. Coleman on The Way Out, How to Overcome Toxic Polarization on Thursday, September 21st from 7 to 8.30 p.m. in the Alumni Campus Center at Loris College. Now therefore I, Brad M. Cavanaugh, Mayor of the City of Dubuque, Iowa, on behalf of the City Council staff and residents of Dubuque, do hereby recognize the United Nations International Day of Peace and proclaim September 6th to October 1st as Days of Peace and Nonviolence and call upon the residents of Dubuque to further affirm a vision of our world at peace by fostering cooperation between individuals, organizations, and nations. Thank you. Thank you. Sounds good. Thank you. Nice to see you. All right.
แบบอินเกิลเนี่ยUm, Children's Cancer Connection, for those of you that don't know, we're a nonprofit and we service families all across Iowa. Our two biggest programs are an oncology camp and a sibling camp, and it is a week-long day camp where the kids actually spend the night, and if you can believe it, our oncology kiddos have a full medical team, so they're allowed to leave the hospital if the doctors permit and come spend a normal week at camp. Our mission is the entire family, the entire journey, so equally as important is our fall camp for the siblings. Siblings go through just as much of a journey as the cancer kiddos do, and we firmly believe that we need to serve the whole family. So on behalf of CCC, I'd like to thank the city of Dubuque for recognizing this month on behalf of, of Childhood Cancer Awareness. Well, Mitchell, thank you very much for being here to accept the proclamation and for that great information. I didn't, I didn't know that. I think you've taught us some things here tonight and I really appreciate the fact that you're using your voice to be able to um, really be a part of this movement. So thank you very much. Thank you. City Dubuque Proclamation. Whereas childhood cancer is the leading cause of death by disease in children, and whereas one in 285 children in the United States will be diagnosed by their 20th birthday, and whereas 47 children per day, or 17,155 children per year, are diagnosed with cancer in the U.S. And whereas the average age of diagnosis is six years old, compared to 66 years for adult cancer diagnosis. And whereas two-thirds of childhood cancer patients will have chronic health conditions as a result of their treatment toxicity, with one quarter being classified as severe to life-threatening. And whereas in the last 20 years, only four new drugs have been approved by the FDA to specifically treat childhood cancer. And whereas the National Cancer Institute recognizes the unique research needs of childhood cancer and the associated need for increased funding to carry this out. And whereas hundreds of nonprofit organizations at the local and national level, including Children's Cancer Connection, Family Cancer Network, and Unravel Iowa, are helping children with cancer and their families cope through educational, emotional, and financial support. And whereas too many children are affected by this deadly disease, and more must be done to raise awareness and find a cure. Now therefore I, Brad M. Cavanaugh, Mayor of the City of Dubuque, Iowa, on behalf of the City Council staff and residents of Dubuque, do hereby proclaim September 2023 as Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. All right, Trish. Next on the agenda are consent items. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting in person who would like to have one of the items removed from the consent agenda for separate discussion and consideration, please approach the podium when the mayor asks if there's any in-person input. Please remember to state your name and address clearly for the record. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input. If more than one participant would like to speak, when city, then city, city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Please state the item you would like to remove from the <coughs> consent agenda for separate discussion and consideration. Consent items can be found on pages two through five. Thank you, Trish. All right, do we have anyone here in chambers who would like to remove any of the consent items for separate discussion this evening? Seeing no one here, do we have anyone virtually who would like to remove anything? You do not. Thank you very much. Anyone from the city clerk's office? Okay. So with that, I'll bring it back to the table for a motion, please. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Resnick. I move to receive and file the documents, adopt the resolutions, and deal with the consent items as recommended. Second by Farber. Got a motion by Resnick, second by Farber. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Jones. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Sprank. Aye. 
Wethel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Cavanaugh? Aye. Barber? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. We'll move on to items to be set for public hearing. We have four agenda items to be set for public hearing, all being set for September 18th, 2023. Proposed development agreement by and between the City of Dubuque, Iowa and HG Apt LLC provided for the providing for the issuance of urban renewal tax increment revenue grant obligations pursuant to the development agreement for the property located at 2901 Central Avenue, formerly the Holy Ghost School, to uh, create 18 new market rate rental units. Two is Mouse Lake Plumbing Pumping Station Culvert Repair Project. Uh, proceedings for public hearing on the issuance of not to exceed 100, 1 million sewer revenue capital loan notes, state revolving funds planning and design loan applications, proceedings for public hearing on the issuance of not to exceed 430,000 sewer revenue capital loan notes, state revolving funds planning and design loan applications. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel, sorry. I move to receive and file, adopt the resolutions, and set the public hearings for September 18th. Second by Sprank. A motion by Roussel, second by Sprank. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Jones. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Barber. Aye. We pass the 7 0. Moving on to boards and commissions, we have review for the Equity and Human Rights Commission. All right, thank you, Trish. So we have. Two terms that are up here. We have one three-year term through January 1st, 2024. We also have one other term, uh, one other three-year term through January 1st, 2025. Um, one of them is uh, a term that's being vacated through 24, I see. So we have two applicants tonight to review. Um, Michaela Freiberger is the first. Do we have anyone here to speak to that application? Seeing no one. Our second applicant is David Heyer. Do we have anyone here to speak to that application? Good evening, Mayor Kavanaugh, City Council members, City staff. My name is Dave Heyer, 805 Cary Chill Drive. I've been a resident for over 18 years. Thanks for this opportunity to introduce myself and tell a little bit about my interest in serving on this commission. Uh, it's actually been over 10 years since I've stood at this podium uh, when I served as the city's economic development director for, for eight years and then retired in 2013. I also have spent uh, much of my career in city government. I have 44 years in serving local cities um, as either a city manager or as an economic development director and even as a community coach. Uh, so with that background, obviously I know about boards and commissions and their roles. And I also feel like I can bring some organizational strengths to, to, to that board. Um, but, but the most important part, I guess, and, and for, for me is my passion about equity. And that's why I'm applying to be on, on this board. Since I retired the second time about a year ago, I've been doing a lot of volunteer work in, in the community, particularly, uh, with the Community Foundation and participated in their equity series, their seven part uh, monthly series on, on equity issues and listened to the panels, but also then help facilitate community conversations following those panel discussions. Currently, I have agreed to be part of their Better Together Committee, which is just in the process of being organized now in Dubuque. It's a coalition of people who are concerned about migration and immigrants, and, and it's an effort to try to make Dubuque a more welcoming community for migrants and immigrants. So I'm sure you'll be hearing more about that as we kind of get ourselves together, but that's just in the initial process. In 2019, I um, became a Franciscan associate here in Dubuque with the Franciscan Sisters, and one of their 
primary objectives, goals for the next six years, probably three years left, is to address systemic racism. So that's given me an opportunity to not only read a number of, of books, participate in panel discussions, and uh, listen to speakers talking about racism and microaggressions. And now we're starting to talk about, uh, in addition to that, uh, land justice, taking a look at how we can be more attuned to some of our acts as colonizers of the United States. So I guess based on, on my current passion for, for equity and my past experience in local government, I offer my services to you uh, uh, to be on this commission for the Equity and Human Rights Commission. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to address those. Thank you, Dave. Any questions for Dave? Thank Seeing you. None, thank you very much for being here to speak to your application. All right, Trish, we can go ahead and move on. Moving on, we have public hearings. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting in person who would like to discuss one of the public hearing items, please approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any in-person input for a public hearing you would like to speak to. Please state your name and address clearly for the record. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function and state your question. Phone participants, please state your name and address when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input for a public hearing you would like to speak to. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Public hearing number one is proposed development agreement by and between the city of Dubuque, Iowa and Farley and Letcher. 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 I, LLC providing for the issuance of urban renewal tax increment revenue grant obligations pursuant to the development agreement. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Resnick. I move to receive and file and adopt the resolution. Second. Second. I got a motion by Resnick, second by Jones. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Economic Development Director Jill Connors is recommending City Council adopt the resolution approving a proposed development agreement by and between the City of Dubuque and Farley and Letcher LLC, providing for the issuance of urban renewal tax increment revenue grant obligations. Matt Mulligan is a member of Farley and Letcher LLC. Matt Mulligan has been an instrumental developer in the city's effort to close the gap in available housing in the City of Dubuque. Matt Mulligan successfully completed the historic redevelopment of the Kretschmer Lofts at 220 East 9th Street creating 48 new market rate rental units in the historic Millwork District. He is also the owner of Switch Development LLC, which is constructing over 100 new single family residences within the city. Farley and Letcher LLC intends to rehabilitate the structure at 801 Jackson Street to revitalize the building and create 126 new market rate rental units in the upper stories. The project will utilize historic tax credits the remainder of the funding being a combination of private and public financing. The property located at 801 Jackson Street is in the historic Millwork District and has remained partially vacant for several years. The key elements of the development agreement include the following. Number one, developer will make a capital investment of approximately $25 million to rehabilitate the facility. Number two, the developer must create 126 market rate residential rental units Number three, the developer will receive 15 years of tax increment financing incentives in the form of semi-annual rebates. Tax increment financing incentives are estimated to not exceed $2,630,619. Number four, the city to award a downtown housing incentive grant in the amount of $750,000, which is $10,000 times 75 units. Number five, the city to award a planning and design grant, a facade grant, and a financial consultant grant not to cumulatively exceed $35,000. Number six, City Dubuque will amend the Greater Downtown Urban Renewal District Plan to accommodate the issuance of tax increment financing incentives. 
The development agreement requires the developer to accept applications from prospective tenants with housing choice vouchers issued under the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development Section 8 voucher program or a similar program that are otherwise qualified prospective tenants. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Mike. We are on a public hearing to consider develop a development agreement by and between the City of Dubuque, Iowa and Farley and Letcher LLC, providing for the issuance of urban renewal tax increment revenue grant obligations. Do we have anyone here in the chambers to speak to us on this item tonight? Yeah, come on up. I'll just remind you, put, um, please state your name and address. And there's a little button there on the right. And if you feel like you're covered up by that computer, you can feel free to move the podium up and down. I think we're good. All right. <laughs> can you hear me OK? Yeah, maybe just a little closer to the, like pull the mic a little closer to you. There you go, thank you. Good evening, City Council. I'm Wendy Hopp. I live at 2193 Southway Drive. I've lived there for just over 12 years now. And I'm here this evening to talk about the development at the 801 Jackson Street location. I'm speaking today because I'm concerned about our housing situation. I have a child, and if he wanted to move out right now, I'd want to make sure that he had safe and dignified housing available. We're predicted to be short over 1,000 units by 2030, just seven short years away. This housing shortage will, without a doubt, disproportionately impact youth and people of color if it isn't already. I'm not just worried about my son but the future of our community. If we're not developing while creating space and protections for young people getting out the gate. Dubuque is a community that drew me in because of its big city size, but small town feel. And in small towns, we take care of each other. We know this city is concerned with this shortfall and is in the process of developing apartments to meet the need. But development without long-term focus, both on the needs of our city and its residents of all incomes, is lacking a holistic approach to the housing crisis. The council has laid out approximate rent in this development through their communications, which we appreciate. 123 of the 126 units per these communications will be at 1,200 a month for rent. What this means is these apartments are feasibly affordable for people that are making 48,000 or more a year. So, how about we set aside 20% of these for lower and moderate income households? This would make the agreement not only provide crucially needed apartments in <clears throat> downtown Dubuque, but also would make sure that people that are being most impacted by the housing crisis are put first. If we set aside these units for people that make $27,000 to $44,000 a year, we will ensure that they will have a place in the development, not just according to what they can afford, but also by contract. Putting lower and moderate income restrictions on these apartments for the duration of the tax increment financing and abatements will allow us to say with certainty that safe and dignified housing will exist for people that are not making as much as some. I also ask, are there developments in the pipeline that have lower and moderate income restricted units for all Dubuque residents in the downtown or north end? Also, what efforts are underway to retain our youth and attract more? I'm not alone in wanting my kids to have somewhere safe to stay. To frame all of this, I want somewhere my kids and young people in this community can thrive, not just survive. We want development without displacement or exclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy, for your comments. And, and while, while it is polite, I, I would ask that we please refrain from applause during the public comment period. So thank you very much. Hello. Um, my name is Gail Weitz. I live at 1630 Lori Court here in Dubuque. I'm a member of the um, Iowa CCI, and um, I'm a former board member of the Housing Commission. And I'm here today to talk about the 801 Jackson Street Development Agreement, 
development is good, and anyone here can tell you that we need more housing units in the city of Dubuque, because we can't move forward without it. The housing shortage is all around for folks of all incomes, but there is no doubt that folks of lower and moderate income are the most impacted on, by the housing shortage. And these are the people that are most often being subjugated to poor housing conditions, living without dignity, without safety or dignity. They're sharing space with cockroaches, they're having electric bills that are hundreds of dollars, and they're having to deal with landlords that do not respect their property, their tenants, or their tenants' rights. But the good news is that development doesn't have to be so divisive, where one party gets everything and the, less, the rest are left to the win. Everyone can benefit from new housing regardless of income, and everyone should. No matter what your income is, everyone is paying taxes that are funding this development and all city invested developments. If we're paying in, we all should benefit. The poor and working of this city should get a piece of the progress pie. We need mixed income housing in Dubuque for people of all ages, working status, and family sizes. People that are making 50 to 80% of the area medium income should get a piece of this development not just with this development, but many more, especially in the downtown and the North End. So here is what we ask. We're calling on you to table this vote until you have the opportunity to discuss with the developer 20% of the unions of 801 Jackson being income restricted for folks with moderate and lower income. And I appreciate your listening. Thank you. Thank you, Gail, for your comments. Do you have any other public input this evening? Oh, that's as high as it goes. Okay. Okay. Hello, my name is Nina Erba. I live on 180 West 15th Street, and that uh, address is significant because I happen to live in a building that is managed by a nonprofit which allows for rent control apartments, and I consider myself lucky. This is how Merriam-Webster defines the word gentrification, a process in which a poor area, as of a city, experiences an influx of middle class or wealthy people who renovate and rebuild homes and businesses, and which often results in an, in an increase in property values and the displacement of earlier, usually poorer residents. Now, you could argue that since the Millwork District is already fluxed with people who already can pay the rents that we are describing, that they, that this building would not be subject to gentrification. The North End, however, is a perfect example, and I bring that up because my hand was forced to speak today when I read the TH last week, when I read that the Manders siblings in Dubuque are looking to come to this very building at the next city council meeting in two weeks to speak about how they want to turn the former Holy Ghost school into an apartment building full of market rate apartments. This is after they turned the next door building into a b building full of not only market rate apartments, but also an Airbnb. And I am sorry, but I don't think you have a concept of how poor we actually are. Some of us here are trapped in the benefits cliff. And I don't use that word lightly. We are trapped. I have to keep my wages artificially low, or otherwise I lose my social security disability check, which I depend on paying my rent. I have a friend who unfortunately couldn't make it here today, who has to keep her wages artificially low so that she can stay on Medicaid and have some semblance of security and making sure that she gets the insulin that she needs so that she does not literally die. To speak of nothing of the people here who are also on fixed income and have no way of making sure that they can be able to raise the wages that they are already receiving, we are not being lazy, sitting around all day eating fudge rounds. We are suffering from constant anxiety about how we can be able to make enough money so that we can be able to both pay the rent and put food on the table. And we are happy to speak with you on a personal level, one-on-one. -on -one. But if you don't want us to come here and speak on this very issue every single time that there is a development waiting to be issued, please start taking us seriously. Thank you. Thank you, Nino, for your comments. Any other public input this evening?
Good evening, Mr. Mayor, ladies and gentlemen of the council, <clears throat> city manager Mike Van Milligan, most excellent city staff. My name is Rick Dickinson. I have the pleasure of serving as the president of Greater Dubuque Development Corporation. Uh, and I'm here professionally and personally in full support of uh, this project before the council this evening, and I urge your favorable consideration of it. Uh, it was mentioned earlier by a previous speaker that the city is aware of a housing shortage uh, of a thousand. Uh, in fact, our organization, Greater Dubuque Development Corporation, was responsible for that study. We contracted uh, with ECIA, the East Central Intergovernmental Association, to conduct that study in our market, and it was focused on Dubuque alone, and the outcome was a need for 1,100 units in Dubuque. In order for that to, to occur in our market, changes had to be made. And so the community came to the mayor and council, as we often do for change, and said, would you please develop policies that will create housing for our workforce, housing for uh, our Dubuqueers, the people who are currently here and the people we hope to attract. Uh, realizing that our vacancy rate was approximately one half of 1%. And I'm here to say thank you. Thank you to the mayor and council, city manager and staff for putting those incentives together and it is producing fruit. And with before the end of this fiscal year, there will be announcements of housing expansion exceeding the initial projection for the benefit of all. It's about supply and demand. Increasing the supply of homes in this market will reduce inflation for housing in our market. And the Farley Letcher project in association and relationship to affordable housing are not mutually exclusive. Let, let me repeat that. The Farley Letcher project and the development of low income housing, affordable housing, are not mutually exclusive. This particular project is a classic example of adaptive reuse, which has been done previously successfully in the Millwork District. The cost of adaptive re reuse of a facility like the Farley Letcher uh, development, manufacturing facilities that are being converted to residential is much higher, the cost is much higher than new construction. But unless we find ways of incenting the private sector to invest huge amounts of money, $25 million in this case, these buildings would continue to stand there and rot as a hollowed out shell in the heart of our city. So thank you for creating the programs and the incentives that are making adaptive reuse possible in downtown Dubuque. Thank you for addressing the need for over 1,100 units in our market so that we can re retain and recruit the talent that we need. Thank you for reacting to the needs, and I appreciate your favorable consideration of this uh, public hearing and the motion before you. Thank you. Thank you, Rick, for your comments. Nino's a bit tall, so I'm going to put this down. It's in the front. Oh. There it is. Okay. Um, yeah, we're not all six foot, you know. Um, um, yeah, so I'm a member of Iowa CCI. My name's Jaime Izaguirre. Uh, that's Iowa Citizens for Community Improvement. Um, yeah, um, incentives are good, right? Um, and government funds should be used to prop up the needs of a community, right? Um, and I think pretty much anyone here with CCI will tell you that, right? And as, I, as one of our speakers said before, we need development. And uh, it's very clear that that 1,000 uh, plus number is not gonna go away without government investment, right? Um, but when we're talking about the housing shortage and talking about the production of housing, the question that underlies that is for who, right? And it's like, we're not, we're not trying to say that development is bad. What we're trying to say is that this is disparate. The outcome is disparate. The people who are benefiting from this is disparate. There are only, to our knowledge, seven income-restricted apartment complexes in the city. Seven. And four of those are only for young people or people who are non-elderly, right? Um, and, you know, we need uh, income-restricted housing for elderly folks, too. But that begs the question, when are we going to get some mixed-income housing, 
right? Um, and we conducted over three, we got over 300 survey responses over the summer, many of them saying the exact same thing that we're saying right now, right? People want mixed income development in the downtown and in the north end, right? Um, and just to lay it out, right? Government investment without an ask or a requirement that benefits people is corporate welfare, right? Um, and so we're, we're very clear about that, right? And uh, we like the fact that Section 8 is like non-discriminatory, right, uh, as part of this development agreement, but it needs to go further. We need a set aside. We need a piece of the pie, right? And uh, we're not going away until we get some mixed income housing. And, uh, you know, we, we haven't approached you guys about this yet, so we, we can't say for certain whether you're for or against it. but. We're, we're here with you, right? And we'll, we'll walk it through. We've done a lot of research. We can meet with you. But uh, I think it, it can start here, right, um, to, to say the least. And, uh, you know, um, if you guys sit down with the developer and you ask, can, can we do 20% uh, restricted income units, which they would receive additional government funding for in the, firm, uh, in the form of tax credits, right, further tax credits, then, uh, you know, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. And we'll understand. But, we don't know what's happening behind closed doors, right? Um, and so we, we wanna see that conversation. Um, yeah, so that's, that's CCI's standpoint. Um, thank you. Thank you, Jaime. Hey, Jaime, before you go, do you have an address you can give us? I didn't oh, hear that part. Oh, yeah, I just moved into a really nice apartment. Uh, 1394 Locust Street, right? I got a nice retro oven, a 70s style den, you know, so. Thank you, Jaime. <laughs> thank you very much. Any other public input this evening? I am six foot tall. Go ahead, thing Matt, go ahead and hit the button. Down. It, it'll help if you hit the button so everybody can hear you. There, it's right in the front. You're just, fine. I'll okay. just move the All mic. Right. Uh, Mayor, council members, Mike Van Milligan and staff. So I'm Matt Mulligan, um, 501 Bell Street. Um, as you mentioned, I'm the developer of the project. And I'll just highlight really the vision and what the why I chose this building. So I am also the president of Conlin Construction, and we moved our building down to the port, our office. So we're one of the largest employers in Dubuque. And um, so we have also invested in, in downtown. And, you know, when I come downtown and you exit on White Street, the first thing you see are three very large vacant buildings. And that's the first thing a lot of people see when they come visit our community. And as you venture further into whether it's downtown Main Street or Millwork District, et cetera, the, you know, that, that vibe changes, no doubt. But the first thing you see are, are vacant buildings. And so that is your initial perception. And what we did with the Kretschmer building and what we've done with this particular building, um, we brought some young talent that's in Dubuque that works downtown. And we said, what do you want? What's, what's important to you? You know, you go to a traditional apartment complex in Iowa City or the Quad Cities or what have you, and you'll have a gym, you'll have a pool, and you know, amenities like that that you're used to seeing, and, and that was not on the list. And so there were other amenities that they wanted, you know, a rooftop accessible, they wanted, you know, things like that to, to really accommodate that feel of urban living in small town Dubuque. And so we incorporated those into Kretschmer, and we're incorporating those into um, into the Farley and Letcher. And I'm happy to say that the the Kretschmer building is it's fully leased, and it leased up very quick. And that identifies the fact that there is a lack of housing, as has been expressed. And I appreciate everybody's comments this evening, by the way. Um, as Mr. Van Milligan had stated, you know I'm a part of a lot of different housing projects in the community. Some like this, some for sale, a variety of different income type products. And so I look at that as one, a business owner who it's, it's my job and it's our job to attract talent, incoming talent, um, high level talent, everything in between. And so having the various types of products available in our market, both for sale, for rent, et cetera, that's what I'm trying to accomplish. And so uh, this is a particular type of course, uh, this is market rate housing. Um, the units are gonna range from 600 square feet to a little bit bigger than that. But, you know, it's 126 new units that, that I think we need that the talent that 
is working in downtown, my company being one of them, um, we need to have so we can continue to really promote that professional level staff uh, that's coming and choosing Dubuque over Iowa City, over the Quad Cities, over what have you. As an employer, I can tell you we're fighting those communities for talent. And so having housing like this is, is critical. And to all the points that were said, every income level housing choice is critical. This is, this is one piece. This is one piece of it. One project isn't going to accomplish all of it. Um, and I appreciate the councils and uh, the leadership from, from you as the council, from city manager, and trying to accomplish each one of those. And as you look in the projects that are in development or under construction today in the community, you'll see that we do have a lot of that. We have some on the higher end and we have some on the lower end and everything in between. So as a community, and frankly a member of our community, I'm, I'm happy to see that we are accomplishing that really across the full spectrum. But as was stated tonight, I wish things cost less than they do. It, it costs a lot to build things right now. It costs a lot to finance things right now. And it's, it's a challenge. So getting this done is, is on the top of my list. I know it's on the top of your list. And, and um, so I'll stop there. But I will say, again, I appreciate you. I appreciate you considering this. To everybody that spoke this evening, I appreciate all of your words. And as somebody who develops housing in the community, believe me, your, what you are after is not lost on me. And so I know myself and other developers, we are looking at how can we best accomplish that. So thank you. Thank you, Matt, for your comments. Anyone else this evening? Okay, I'll check virtually here. Do we have any virtual comments, Corey? Do not. Okay, anyone from the city clerk's office? No. Okay, and back one more chance for going once, going twice. All right, so after this, we are gonna, um, there'll be no more public input on this item. We're gonna bring it back to the table and it'll just be council discussion. Okay. Back to the table then for discussion, and I'm actually gonna kick us off tonight. So um, first, first and foremost, thank you so much for, for the, the great discussion on this particular item. Um, not only have some of you spoken tonight, we've received a lot of email input on this item as well. Um, and I know a lot of that is coming directly from the, the work that CCI is doing. So thank you for doing that here in Dubuque and for communicating with us in this way. Um, and I'm, I'm just gonna echo kind of what Matt just said at the end there. I really appreciate everybody's aspect of the, of the conversation here. In my mind, we are still very much at the beginning of this conversation. Um, I wrote back to a lot of you who wrote, uh, you know, there was a letter that came our way and I responded, I tried to respond to everyone, so I hope I hit every letter that came my way, but I, I tried to respond and um, I, I put some thought into, the, in, into my response and looked a little bit into the, the situation of, of what we're trying to do here in Dubuque. One of the things that struck me was, you know, we really haven't developed housing in Dubuque in any real numbers since the 1990s. We just haven't really done it. And there are a lot of reasons why. A lot of it was economical. Um, a lot of it was very much in line with what was happening across the nation. I mean, open any news source today and what you're gonna see is housing shortage, housing shortage, housing shortage. It's, it's just everywhere, all across the country. Everybody's dealing with it differently. And one of the things that's important, I think, as we think about who we are and what we're doing in Dubuque is that we have to do this in a way that's going to work for us. And that is really an important piece of why it's, I think it's incredibly essential that we're all having this conversation in the way that we're having it. Um, the comments that you made tonight and the, this idea of making sure that we are focusing on housing at all income levels, first of all, is absolutely something that we have talked about frequently here. We're, we're trying very hard to do that as a city council and as a city of Dubuque. Um, but secondly, the ideas that you have are some new ideas that I haven't quite dealt with yet and thought through too much. And I'm really looking forward to being able to, to do that a little bit more and have this conversation and further it. Um, as I mentioned in the, in the letter that I responded uh, with to, to many of you, um, I am, my position tonight, I'll just start with my position tonight and I'm gonna tell you why. I, I'm gonna vote for this development agreement as it is. And the reason that I plan to do that is because I think that that's where we are in this particular spectrum of housing right now in the city of Dubuque. We need housing at all levels, absolutely. And there may come a time, and it might not be too far ahead, I'm not sure yet, 
when we have to incentivize certain types of housing over others. But right now, we need to incentivize housing, period. We have got to get this moving. And one of the reasons that I feel comfortable saying that is because I think there's very good evidence in the literature on housing that says that when you promote housing in general, even if it's market rate housing primarily, that there's a spectrum of housing that then is created and people can move along that spectrum. Now, are those, is the housing for people at every income level gonna be exactly where everybody wants it? That's a tough one to do, right? And that's something we need to think about as we move it forward. But what we need right now is we need to get housing for people who want it at whatever income level they're at. And we need to take those places that you mentioned. There was somebody, and I, I'm sorry, I wrote notes down here, but actually it was Gail. Um, mentioned that there are tenants that are sharing um, space with cockroaches and landlords that are not considering their rights as tenants and really high utility bills. If I'm gonna be honest with you, one of my goals is to make those places just not attractive to anybody. I would like to make it so people don't need to live in those places anymore. And landlords will be forced to make those places nicer than what they are. And if we can build enough housing, we can do that. Nino, you mentioned the Airbnbs. That is absolutely a problem. Um, this, is a, this is a real challenge. We need Airbnbs in Dubuque. Every city that has tourists like we have, we need those places. But we are absolutely in a numbers game when it comes to Airbnbs and VRBOs, and not to denigrate any specific company, but short-term rentals, I'll call them. We, we have a problem with this. We can't regulate short-term rentals in this city based on state legislation. So what that means is we need enough housing that people just get right out of the market of short-term rentals. We can have plenty of short-term rentals for everybody, but you can't make everything a short-term rental. Eventually, we're gonna to need to have some apartments for people. And if we make enough housing, we can do that. There are a lot of ways that we can do this. You're talking about the, the comments we had tonight were coming from one direction. This council's working from another direction. And I think that we're all actually heading in the same general direction. It's how we get there. It's how we get there that we need to continue to discuss. So I'm gonna open it up for the rest of the council, but I, before I do that, I wanna say a couple things. Because um, I think there's some really key comments that I, I wanna make sure I hit on. Are there developments in the pipeline for people of all incomes? The answer is yes. I would refer people to consent item number nine on tonight's agenda. Um, consent item number nine, if you get a chance, write that down and go home and look at the, pull it up on your, um, on your computer to be able to look at it. There is a uh, housing incentive brochure that we have created and city staff have created this. We, uh, as Mr. Dickinson said, we need 1,100 units. Currently in the pipeline, 2,029 units. That's better than we ever expected last year than when we passed these incentives. But if you look at those units, you're gonna see quite a bit that's going. What you're also gonna notice is most of those are not off the ground and are not completed yet. And that's one of the challenges. We have to go full throttle forward to be able to create housing because it is hard to do it right now. It, the costs are very high, it's very difficult to get these places off the ground, but we're working on it and there's a lot of places that are there in the pipeline. Another important question that I wanna make sure um, that, I, that I point out before I open it up to other council discussion here. Um, Jaime, it was you that said this, we don't know what's going on behind closed doors. I get that. Um, I'll tell you exactly what's going on behind closed doors, exactly what you're looking at on this page. When we have closed sessions about development agreements like this, it's about what are we gonna do for this development agreement? Do we as a council agree that this is what we want to provide as a development agreement for this developer? Some of these developments, we've basically come up with sort of a formula that we're using at this point. We don't talk about every single one of these in closed sessions, but a lot of them we do. And when we talk about that in closed session and the developer and the city come to an agreement, it then comes right here before everybody in the public. Um, I can tell you, uh, you know, being a person who's very new to this mayor role, um, I didn't know exactly what happened in closed sessions all the time either, but what I can tell you from a city Dubuque standpoint is what we talk about back there in closed session, we bring out here in open session when it's time to tell everybody about it because it's ready to move forward. And that's after the deal is done, after we figured out what we can do. The final thing I want to point out is, you know, you said this at the end of your comments, you said, um, if you don't want us here, you need to start listening to us. We do want you here. I'm very glad to see you all here tonight. And I'm very glad that we're having this conversation. And we do appreciate the comments. And I hope you continue to come. And we continue to have more people here to be able to have this discussion, because I think it's really important. OK, I'll leave it there now. And then I'll open it up for any other discussion from other council members. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I'm going to ask the city manager to talk a little bit about the urban renewal districts and the urban revitalization districts, because 
one thing that projects like this do is it gives us a little bit of cash to do other projects like what you're talking about. And it's an interesting mechanism that we have that, uh, that the city council and city manager have created to, to enable us to have some funds to use in areas such as low-income housing and centers. Sure, thank you. If you don't mind, I'll make the answer a little bit broader than that. So um, the good news is the comment was made about having a holistic approach, and I think the city council, mayor and city council have done that, and I'll try and describe how some of that is. Um, I would say before you created your incentive packages, you listened to uh, what the community was saying through the equity profiles, and one of those specifically was on housing. And you've amended those uh, incentives since then to even make them even better. Um, but as far as affordable housing, so the mayor mentioned there's over 2,000 uh, units that are on the drawing board right now or have just been completed. And uh, of those, 172 are affordable housing units. So there's 142 of those on Radford Road. Two of them were just completed over the last about 18 months. But then um, in this year's competitive round for low-income housing tax credits, and you have to remember that is competitive. So developers submit an application to the Iowa Finance Authority. The Iowa Finance Authority has a limited amount of low-income housing tax credits that they can give to developers across the state. And this year they awarded 11, I'm sorry, 12 separate developments, low-income housing tax credits. Um, Dubuque got two of those projects. So out of 12 across the state, uh, two of those are gonna be in Dubuque. Um, one of them is 30 units uh, right next to City Hall in the old Heartland building. And then another is uh, 48 units on Radford Road. And so that's where I come up with 142 units on Radford Road, the two that are just completed in that new one, for a total of 172 new affordable restricted rent units. Um, then the mayor and city council doesn't stop there. So you created a program, and this was about seven or eight years ago, where when anybody builds a new residential development like a subdivision, you uh, designate those as what's called housing tax increment financing district that's allowed by state law. Used to not be a tool that was used in Dubuque. It's not used in many, it's not used, there's communities all over the state that don't use the tool. But anyway, you started to use it. And the way it works is that allows you to provide some assistance to make to incentivize that residential subdivision. But then it captures about 40% of all the incremental new taxes created by that development and assigns it only to affordable housing projects. So then what the mayor and city council does is takes those dollars and helps people develop affordable housing in other places in the community. A lot of that has been used to uh, renovate where people buy single family residences and renovate them and then use them as affordable housing. But there's been other projects too, larger ones. And from 2016 to 2023, uh, the, those uh, housing TIF districts have generated over $3 million to support affordable housing in Dubuque. And in the, uh, when the mayor and city council adopt a budget, you adopt a five-year capital plan. And in the five-year capital plan you just adopted, there's millions of dollars more being generated by these residential subdivision housing TIF districts that is gonna be targeted towards affordable housing. Um, so that's another tool that you can, you're allowed to use and you decided to use it thinking about that more holistic approach. And the other thing you looked at when you adopted your housing creation incentives last September is you wanted to see is there a way to incentivize affordable housing outside of low income census tracts. So it doesn't mean because you're low income, you have to live in a low income neighborhood. And so uh, you created some special incentives. So, so these are projects that it would happen out that 
would happen outside of the low income census tracts, you created a program where you'll provide $10,000 per low income unit created. You also created a program called urban revitalization where you'll designate that project, an urban revitalization district, and if they'll be reserved for low income, outside of the low income census tracts, for 10 years, you'll abate 100% of their taxes. So the developer won't have to pay any taxes for 10 years. Now that's different than if a developer were to build a market rate project outside of the low income neighborhoods, they get some abatement assistance because an incentive to do the project, but it's a descending amount of abatement each year. So it's not 100% taxes abated every year for 10 years. It's a formula of, I think it's 90% the first two years, then I think it's 80%, then 70, 60, and it keeps stepping down over the 10 years. So it's not as an attractive incentive. And then also we receive community development block grant funds from the federal government you use those to provide grants to some of these developers that are creating uh, low income housing units outside of the low income census tracts. Then recently, uh, the city of Dubuque compete, uh, participated in a competition. The Iowa Finance Authority and the Iowa Economic Development Authority teamed up and they asked cities across the state, they said, hey, we're going to provide some special incentives for affordable housing, but we want you to compete for those special incentives. And the competition was you submit an application and tell us what are you doing now to help yourself to create housing? And where would you like to see additional uh, units created? So the city of Dubuque submitted an application. It's called Thriving Communities was the name of the competition. And uh, we described all those incentives that you created last September and the results of some of that work. And then we also identified the Central Avenue corridor, which is one of the city council priorities. Hey, we want to get the Central Avenue corridor redeveloped. There's a lot of vacant buildings down there, certainly a lot of vacant upper stories that need to be uh, turned into housing. And so that was our application. So there were only 11 cities across the state that were selected as a thriving community. And the way that, and Dubuque was one of them, and the way that the Iowa Economic Development Authority and the Iowa Finance Authority described that competition was, this is a reward for being creative to help yourself, and we're gonna help you some more. And so how are they gonna help us? So what the, every year, the Iowa Finance Authority does a competition and the Iowa Economic Development Authority for what they call workforce housing tax credits. So it's a little higher income standard than low income housing tax credits, but it's not, it's not market rate. And developers can co compete to get that money. I think, I think it'll be $35 million next year for cities, if I remember the number correctly, we'll be competing for. And um, if you're a, de a developer who is willing to do a development in Dubuque, in the Central Avenue corridor, you will get extra points in your application that you submit to the state. And that's how it's all decided. Every application gets scored. Whoever gets the most points, they just keep going down the list until the money's gone. So the higher up you can get on that list by getting the most points, the better chance you have of getting some of that money. So remember, there's only gonna be 11 cities across the state <coughs> that are gonna get extra points in that competition, and we're one of them. So we anticipate next year that we'll have some more, now in this case, workforce housing uh, tax credits and projects, hopefully in the Central Avenue corridor. Uh, but the Mayor and City Council does another thing. So you've successfully helped 1,115 units abate lead paint hazards in their units. And you also have $4.2 million currently to do more. And this was a competitive process that we competed for a federal grant and successfully got that. So I think the mayor and city council adopted all those incentives last September, recognized that affordable housing needed to be part of the solution 
and it is part of the solution on a, on a pretty successful level, but more to be done, and we continue to work with developers on fulfilling that need for affordable housing, workforce housing, and market rate housing, all three levels. And, and I guess I'll just say that uh, adding 2,000 housing units of any level is going to create new housing for new people coming to Dubuque, and it's going to create new housing for people in Dubuque. And some people are mobily moving upward and are going to move into a higher level of housing and vacate a lower level of housing that will become available for others as well. So and that's, that's not a direct benefit, but it's a, it's a side benefit of just more housing. The other reality is that as uh, housing units become available, rents do kind of soften and, and settle down. They're, they're out of whack right now in a lot of places including here. Um, we've heard the story, I don't know how many times, of, of employers who've found the employee that they want and need for a position and made the offer, and the offer was accepted, and a couple of weeks later they hear from the prospective employees, I can't find a place to live. Can't take your job. That's killing us in a lot of ways. Um, if we haven't got housing, we haven't got growth. If we haven't got growth, we haven't got success. And the, the other piece of the puzzle that's uh, becoming challenging is if you've been paying attention to state government, they're, they're shrinking our ability to tax for anything, and that's, uh, that's going to become a challenge. So we're, it is every person for themselves or every city for themselves in some ways, and we're trying a, a very broad-based approach. Man, I appreciate the things you said tonight. Some of them are, were great. Some of them were helpful. I hope, you're, I hope you're a little enlightened and feeling not quite so bad about us. Um, on your way out the door tonight, too, and I hope that we see you here again. I want to, of course, support this project. It's been a long time in the making. Um, the other thing that we can't afford to have is, is derelict buildings downtown. And this is a huge building that's been empty for a long time. And it's going to be nice to have some life in it at any level, and certainly an improvement for all of us because we're going to reap the benefits of increased taxation from those buildings eventually once the TIFs run out. And the thing that I just want to quickly ask you all to understand is TIF money isn't, I hate to say it's not real money, but it's not money that we're taken out of anywhere and given to somebody. It's money that we, we, we won't be getting right now. That building, at the Friday Lunch Building, for instance, right now, the owners pay property tax based on its current value. Under a TIF program, they'll continue to pay it at that value until the expiration of the TIF. And then we'll have the benefit, as will all the other taxing bodies, of that, all that new value going in all those directions. And I've had some conversations with, with friends on the school board. This has changed, but it used to affect them immediately too. They'd be giving up some money. We'd be giving up their money basically in, in TIFs. And that caused them some hurt. But a lot of the projects we did brought employment to the city. And, and they, to a person on the school board, recognized that the students were better off with employed parents and employment opportunities than they were with, with a few dollars in, in deferred taxes that they were going to benefit from enormously at the end of the TEF period. So a limited set of tools that we've got to work with here. Um, I applaud our staff for, for finding us some, some ways to get around the corners, and we're going to do the very best that we can with this from yesterday, today, and tomorrow. I tell people all the time we're not perfect, but we reach for it all the time, and you're helping us see it. Thank you. Ms. Roussel. Thank you, uh, and thank you, Mr. Jones. I think that you summarized a lot of the benefits so very well, and every single project that comes to us does have a variety of benefits to our community, and certainly one of them is revitalizing the old vacant buildings in downtown, and I think everyone benefits when we no longer have an eyesore of a, of a vacant building just, just sitting there. Um, also, I liked uh, the developer said he asked the youth what they want in our community, and this development is is an answer to that. And I think uh, one of the um, people who spoke tonight mentioned that that we need to have uh, more youth in our community, and they want to stay here. And so we want to make sure that we have um, um, amenities and housing that that's going to retain those youth because our employers need employees. If our, if our community is to thrive, and if our businesses are to thrive, we need to have employees to fill those jobs. The other thing I wanted to 
just reiterate what Mr. Dickinson said was that um, this project and low-income housing, they are, they are not mutually exclusive. So I, I th hope that what um, Mr. Van Milligan stated with all the projects and programs and incentives that we have to bring low-income housing affordable, safe housing to our community are still something that we are focused on. And I feel confident in speaking for everyone at this table that that is something that's really important for us. We want our citizens to live in housing that is, that is safe, that they can afford, that, that we'd want our own family to live in. So that's what we will be striving for in, in a, um, a, a broad approach. So not every single project is going to be maybe specifically targeted at what you might be um, looking for, but I think having a broad overall approach to, as we are taking is going to really benefit our community. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Farber. So I um, very much echo um, all the uh, comments that have been made tonight, but I really want to give you guys a shout out for the emails and for the comments that were shared with us uh, during the course of the last weekend and today. Um, and I appreciated the opportunity to reach out to each one of you uh, that sent us emails. And I think it's just important that, um, and I'm very supportive of energizing our downtown corridor. And I have spent most of my career in life living in apartments in downtown neighborhoods in various cities. So I'm under the impression that, quote unquote, and I think you've heard this before, um, if you build it, they will come. And I think evidence, the millwork, evidence how the downtown in Dubuque was in previous decades, and hopefully that revitalization and that adaptive reuse, um, which is a good example of the Farley and Letcher building and, and Matt and Conlon Construction's work, uh, will begin to um, evolve so that we have a sense of stronger community and stronger opportunities to live, work, and play in the neighborhoods where we can uh, raise our children. And um, hopefully they can feel safe um, and have the opportunity to continue on and to feel comfortable living in Dubuque because we really want people to um, be here for decades and to raise their families here and to have as much appreciation for the city as I do, having um, left and then came, coming back to the city and looking for uh, an opportunity for us to rebuild and to re-energize. Uh, so I'm a proponent of that and I think that your comments are very well received and very much appreciated, and uh, please keep us in, in mind and in touch with us uh, as we communicate this and as we move forward, and I um, will be supporting this project as well. But thank you very much. Ms. Wethel. Well, I just want to say initially, I ran into Jaime at a, an event, and he had shared with me concerns from CCI and your organization regarding this specific building. And, I was surprised. I don't know if I look like that on my face, Jaime, but I was. I, I really, um, I guess it wasn't on my radar in the way of concern the way that he had voiced to me that day. And so I was incredibly grateful for him to bringing it to my attention and then for all of you to send your email of the stated concern. I will say I also there was a spam filter, and so if I didn't get a response to everyone, just know, or if they were delayed, it was because my spam filter was a little heavy this week on that end. But um, the initial concern was that the two bedroom apartments would be $2,400. And I will say that was really of surprise to me, which is why I contacted the city administrative team and I said, first of all, what do we consider a low income housing unit? And what do we consider a moderate income housing unit? Because I think we can all agree that wouldn't be. Well, from my understanding, understanding only 2.5% of the total units of this development would be north of $2,000. And so that was a change in what my initial impression was, was that all of these units were going to be that much. That's, that's not the case. Now, it doesn't mean they're low-income housing. They certainly aren't. But I think the 
data that I sent out after we had requested. In our city, including utilities, moderate income housing is considered $1,400 a month, and we use a two-person income for that calculation. And so the units, as I understand it, then, um, 80 plus units of the 126 will be $1,200, only three units will be north of 2,000, and the remaining will be at or below $1,000 per month. And so I, I absolutely agree that this is not low income housing, but the request made by CCI was that 20% of the units be moderate income housing. And so I will say we're closer than I thought we initially were when I first spoke with you, Jaime. So when I saw your banners when you walked in that said we belong here, yeah, we all belong here. We belong here to have these conversations. I work for you and I need to hear from you these things. Um, to look at a developer who I feel has made a real impact in our community in the ability to bring housing for different levels of professionals to our city. We're talking about you know, folks who are gonna be teachers and police officers and firefighters in some of these developments that Mr. Mulligan has worked in. And so I appreciate that we need to work harder always. We need to take what you have given us in this information and we need to work with it in the future. But I promise you, what we have been talking about is a lot of what you're asking for. As Mayor Kavanaugh had stated, we are working at this. And your, your fight and your effort does not lay empty on me because it invigorates me more to make those efforts mean something. So, I agree with my council members who are going to support this because I wholeheartedly want to. I believe there's a need for this specific building to be developed in this way, and I'm very proud to support it. I'm also proud of all of you for coming here and for sharing your concern with me, and I'll be proud to work with you in the future as we move forward in this effort. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, just a quick note. Sure. I see some ferocious note-taking going on, and I appreciate that. You can access this video anytime on our website, so <laughs> feel free to, to repeat, repeat review and, uh, and re-add it if you need to. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Mr. Spring. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, I can remember gr first coming to this community at 20 years old, having maybe seven, $800 in my checking account. Um, not my best economic decision to come to Dubuque with no job, and no prospect, and I lived in horrific apartments, um, Walnut Street, Third Street, uh, Hill Street, till I finally moved into the North End into a house with a few other folks. So I remember specifically these horrific apartments, and I always remind myself when I talk to younger pe folks in the neighborhood or e in general, like, how much is your rent? And I just think of like, oh, you're paying that much. And it's like, well, that's nearly double or triple my house payment. Um, and I bought a house when things were different, and I understand that now. This, the rules have changed horrifically for younger folks. It is very hard for folks to buy a house that, of, that if you cannot set things aside, the banks aren't in your favor. It's very difficult. Um, but I also hate to see buildings fall apart, buildings go to waste. I like that this building's getting repurposed. I don't agree with all the rents. I do agree with a lot of what was said about ideas, which Mayor Kavanaugh mentioned about thinking some more about th new things that we've never thought about. Um, when we'd sit in some of these closed me meetings, I like to th always remember of folks need to, a place to live, and so I try to advocate for, can we get some more affordable housing units? Can we get some different units? I also understand in construction that buildings cost this much. It costs this much to do this. Prices have definitely not gone down, and that's very frustrating for a developer to all of a sudden change midstream an agreement that we've agreed upon to say, well, we want to do something else. When their finances are set as at a business model at 
making this much income per unit to pay for the building. So I can understand the same frustration. So I really thank you for all coming tonight to bring these ideas forward. I'm gonna agree with what's been presented tonight, but it's definitely something to look at for other developments that come up to us, so thank you. Thank you, Mr. Spring. Mr. Resnick. Yeah, thank you very much. And again, like everyone else, I appreciate your coming. And uh, I understand, uh, now, to me, this is this housing development is part of the mix that we've talked about all up around the table, and it's it's hard though. Uh, I mean, because uh, you work very hard, and and sometimes you work very hard, and you still can't live in a decent place, and that's so frustrating, just so aggravating. You know, you want to throw something, and I and I totally get that, and it always seems that the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And um, so we do know, uh, Mr. Sprank gave a personal story, and, and many others can do that as well, coming here and then uh, slowly building up. But it is very frustrating not having a good, decent place to live. So I'm glad you showed up, because a lot of the times the folks with money do show up, and, uh, and the people that don't have a lot of money don't get organized and don't come and say, you know, that's not right. So I, I'm glad you, you showed up, and I, I hope you go out and vote and, and do, the, uh, do the right thing, get involved. Um, the only thing I was a little bit disappointed was what, what got you all revved up was some, uh, some facts that uh, Ms. Wethel talked about where you, know, you cited a, an inflated number as, well, how are we supporting this type of you know, uh, $2,500 per unit thing? And, and, I just wish you get your facts straight and then come and say, here are the facts, and this isn't right. Uh, so, it, um, so I hope that you come again and say, look at, we're still, we're waiting for that housing you all talked about back in September. And because we're going to be working on it. And so thank you again for coming. And I do support this uh, proposal tonight. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Resnick. All right. We've all had a chance to chime in here, so I'll just close with uh, another thank you for the, the great discussion. Um, like I said, I think we're very much at the beginning of this discussion, even though we've been working on this for years now, and it's definitely uh, something that we are, um, I think we have an opportunity to be an example for other cities to follow, and I, and I would like to see us all work together to be that. So I'm looking forward to, uh, to being able to, to do that all together. The original motion on the table was uh, for Mr. Resnick, seconded by Mr. Jones, to receive and file and adopt this resolution. So, Trish, call the roll, please. Jones? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Weppel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Barber? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Public hearing number two is development, development agreement by and between the city of Dubuque, Iowa, and Chadwick Block, LLC. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move to receive and file the documents and adopt the resolution. Second by Sprank. A motion by Jones, second by Sprank. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Economic Development Director Jill Connors is recommending City Council adopt the attached resolution approving a proposed development agreement by and between the City of Dubuque and Chadwick Block LLC providing for the issuance of urban renewal tax increment revenue grant obligations for a project at 249 West 1st Street. Chadwick Block LLC is owned by Chris Miller. Chris Miller has successfully completed numerous historic redevelopment projects in the city of Dubuque, including 40 to 44 Main Street and 210 Jones Street. Miller is also the developer of 799 Main Street, a previously vacant and underutilized structure that will be rehabilitated to include 36 new rental units. Chadwick Block LLC owns 249 West 1st Street, intends to rehabilitate the structure to revitalize the first floor commercial space and create through new, three new market rate rental units in the upper stories. The project will utilize historic tax credits with the remainder of the funding being a combination of private and public financing. This rehabilitation project is very important to the city because it is right at the main gateway to downtown and is in very poor condition. The difficulties with this project are leading to the recommendation to include a zero interest loan of available downtown rehabilitation funds. Dubuque Initiatives also assisted the property owner with some of the project financing. 
The key elements of the development agreement include the following. Number one, developer will make a capital investment of approximately $1.5 million to rehabilitate the facility. Number two, developer must create three market rate residential rental units. Number three, developer will receive the new 15 years of tax income and financing incentives. Tax income and financing incentives are estimated to not exceed $168,683. Number four, city to award a downtown housing incentive grant in amount of $30,000 or $10,000 for each of three units. Number five, city to award a downtown rehabilitation loan in the amount of $340,000 at zero interest with principal payments beginning the first day of the first month after a certificate of completion is issued. The entire balance of the loan shall become due and payable not later than the first day of the 72nd month after a certificate of completion is issued. Number six, city to award a planning and design grant, facade grant, and financial consultant grant to not cumulatively exceed $35,000. Number seven, city Dubuque will amend the Greater Downtown Urban Renewal District Plan to accommodate the issuance of tax increment financing incentives. The development agreement requires a developer to accept applications for prospective tenants with housing choice vouchers that are otherwise qualified prospective tenants. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Mike. We are on a public hearing to consider a development agreement by and between the city of Dubuque, Iowa and Chadwick Block LLC providing for the issuance of urban renewal tax increment revenue grant obligations for a project at 249 West 1st Street. Do we have anyone here in the chambers to address us on this item? Seeing no one here, we have anyone virtually? We do not. Thank you, Corey. Anyone from the city clerk's office? Thank you, Trish. All right, back to the table then for discussion. Mr. Go ahead, Ms. Farber. Yeah. yeah, I just want to give a shout out to Chris Miller for this um, historic preservation and the uh, reuse of this uh, building. And it is kind of a gateway building for the city as people are coming in off of the highway or on that main street. And so us. Um, Really, I think, very noteworthy and uh, very much appreciate his efforts. Thank you, Ms. Farber. Yeah, Ms. Wethel. As the um, councilwoman who represents Ward 4, I, I want to say that this building is a building that for many years I drove by and I thought, gosh, I just wish that building looked better. <laughs> It's one of those buildings that people see when they first drive into this city. And I don't know if anybody's driven by it lately, but I don't think that anymore. It is gonna be beautiful. And so I'm grateful also to Chris Miller and his colleagues for moving forward with this development and look forward to seeing those, um, those facilities filled soon. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. It's been said a lot more politely, but that building was a sorry mess. And it's really looking pretty good now. Way to go, Chris. Thank you, Mr. Jones. All right. Well, I couldn't say that any better. So the motion on the table is uh, to receive and file, adopt the resolution. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Jones. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Weppel. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Barber. Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Public hearing number three is Chaplin Schmidt Island Trail Connection Project. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move to receive and file and adopt the resolution. Second. Got a motion by Jones, second by Wethel. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. City Engineer Gus Ahoyas is recommending City Council approve the plan, specifications, form of contract, an estimated cost of $1,041,415 for the Chaplin Schmidt Island Trail Connection Project through the adoption of the enclosed resolution. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Mike. We are in a public hearing to consider Chaplin Schmidt Island Trail Connection Project, Iowa DOT project number EDP 21007047Y31. That was fun to say. Do we have anyone here to address us on this item? Anyone virtually? You do not. Thank you. No. All right, thank you. Back to the table then. I felt like Star Wars there for a second. 
there were a lot of letters and numbers coming together. I don't know if anybody else felt that way. Maybe I'm just watching a lot of Star Wars lately. Any discussion on this item? Mr. Mayor? Mr. Resnick. I think it's uh, very uh, uh, timely and it's overdue actually to get this connected up. We have a beautiful, beautiful Captain uh, Chaplain Schmidt Island and it's just gonna become even better. Uh, and I've gone there, but it's it's kind of an old school connection. And you know, it, it, I feel sometimes if when I'm going to the island from the other side, that you know, we, if we can brave the journey across the abyss, we'll make it to a, a great location. That's what it feels like right now. So I'm I think this will be great and inviting place. Uh, for people to come, and uh, it's a it's a it's a great place for uh, for families, and let's make it a welcoming to everyone. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Very well said, Mr. Resnick. I totally agree with that. Well, I I, I have to agree. I mean, it's um it's a great place to hike and bike Schmidt Island already. It is, but this is going to be so much better, and it's going to help us get there. Um, that's the biggest challenge that we have. So there's some major things in the works to be able to do this. Um, but this this trail will be a, a very nice addition. I do think um, it, we would be remiss if we didn't point out the fact that some of the funding from this is coming from community project funding, formerly known as earmarks. Um, so we, we very much appreciate the, the help of Congresswoman Hinson in making this possible and her office and staff uh, because they did a lot of work to be able to make sure that this community project was something that was on the list. So this is wonderful to see this moving forward. All right, with that, motion is to receive and file, adopt the resolution. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Jones? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprang? Aye. Weffel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Barber? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Next on the agenda is public input. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting may address the City Council on the action items on the agenda or on matters under the control of the City Council. For all in-person attendees, please approach the podium and clearly state your name and address for the record when the mayor asks if there is any in-person input. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function for the record. Phone participants, please state your name and address for the record when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Individual remarks are limited to five minutes and the overall public input period is limited to 30 minutes. Under the Iowa Open Meetings Law, the city council can take no formal action on the comments given during public input or that do not relate to an action item on tonight's agenda. Thank you, Trish. Do we have any public input this evening? Good evening. Um, I know two of you. My name is Catherine Sorensen. I live at 2613 Jackson. So I've met the manager several times. Hmm. Um, of course, my councilman I've met more than once. Um, Kaminsky Park is absolutely amazing. Every city needs that template. The, the neighborhood loves it, the children love it. So phase two, um, I would love to see if we can get that rolling. That includes a walking path for the adults, which we need. Um, and two more things for that is trees, shade, and hanging baskets. We, as a community, and I've only lived here three and a half years. So as a community, when I got involved, um, I think we all focused on what the children needed, what the kids needed. And now the adults were like, well, what about us? There's a few things we'd like out of this park right now, and we don't have it. Um, so there's a couple of different things I'm gonna mention here. 2600 Jackson, that corner building is owned by the city of Dubuque. That is your lead house. So when people have lead in their homes and they need to vacate their homes, you move them into 2600 Jackson. There is a gorgeous tree in the backyard. I believe it's an oak tree. It desperately needs trimming, desperately. I don't own a tree. You would not know that come October or November because that tree likes my backyard a lot and a few of the other neighborhood trees. But when the storms come, I get tree limbs, we get everything, and it just needs to be drastically trimmed. Whoever does 
your um, landscaping, your mowing, um, just because I'm OCD, can they please trim the sidewalks from the weeds so that it looks like, like a nice little edge and it doesn't look like it's overgrown like my neighbors? So they won't have that unit and mine and then maybe my neighbor in the middle will decide to do something with his sidewalk. <laughs> um, 600 square feet. Does anybody know how big that is for an apartment? It's tiny at 1,200 a month. I am blessed. I have the most amazing landlord in the city of Dubuque, I believe. But my daughter, who is a recent college grad, and my brother, who is unfortunately no longer with us, have both, I spent the last year and a half looking. There's not much out there. And 600 square feet at 1,200 a month is not affordable even for a college student. Because if they're coming out of school making 40, 45 grand a year, take out the 20% in taxes, take out their car note, take out their car insurance, now you gotta take on an additional 14,000, maybe 14,500 for rent. You haven't even thrown in utilities, student loans, and food. And you're saying, oh, you need to pay $1,200 a month. You're asking what is affordable. $1,200 a month is not affordable to somebody making 40, 45 grand a year. It's just not, not with the cost of everything else on top of it including food, and then you're gonna tell them, we'll go into 600 square feet of living space for 1,200. You wanted to answer the question, I'm answering the question. That's not affordable. That's not what you can provide people who need a income-based apartment and not be on section eight. Not all of us want to be on Section 8. Not everybody, you know, I'm fortunate I have two incomes at the moment, but I wouldn't be able to do it on my own. There's just no way. Um, I'm looking at the North End, and I made the comment about the walking path. Um, walk Jackson from the north end to the south end. Just, just try to walk that sidewalk in the 2500 block of Jackson. Those are rentals. So if they're being inspected every five years, those sidewalks are dangerous. There are sidewalks in that area on the way to Kaminsky Park that people's bushes are so far out on the sidewalk, you can't walk to get to Jackson, to get to Kaminsky Park. That's why we want a walking path, because then I can drive the two blocks that I shouldn't be driving, walk the walking path, and then come back. Because you can't walk it at night, it's too dangerous. Once it gets dark, it's not the neighborhood that's dangerous, it's the sidewalks that are dangerous. Because you can't see. Something I've noticed in three and a half years, and I know this from experience, I know this from where I grew up, for over 50 years, and I watched the neighborhood go downhill, and it's slowly making steps back now. But two things I've noticed that I've noticed on the North End, and it's concerning, and I've made it known, but I will make it known as much as I can. Use car lots in a neighborhood of homes, not good idea. It makes the neighborhood look bad, it makes the community look bad, and it breeds an element that you might not want. I'm not saying it's happening, I'm saying it could. Same thing with when the Pizza Hut left and that was purchased by a church non for profit and now it's a used car lot. And the, and the church owning a, a business, and there was nothing you could do about that. You can prevent your own properties from being purchased by non for profits. But now for profits, remember one thing, they don't pay property taxes. So they're not giving anything back to that community, except now we have used car lots. And I'm not understanding why we need so many used car lots because it's, it's, they're making the profit. We all know where that goes. They buy them on auction, they come into the neighborhood, they oversell them. And I think with, from 
20th to 32nd, just in that area between Central and um, what's it after Jackson? I know I've lived here. I should know what that is. That's Washington. Okay. See, I've got it. <laughs> I think there's like five. And when I moved here three and a half years ago, there was one. So that's concerning. Um, I appreciate you listening to my complaints, but again, Comiskey Park, oh my gosh, I, I have been bragging about Comiskey Park, even to the people back home saying, here's how you make a park work. And they're like, yeah, but that's money. I said, yeah, go, go get some grants, make this rapid. It is, it is gorgeous, it's beautiful, and um, yeah, phase two, please, P please, thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Any other public input this evening? Good evening, Mayor Cavanaugh, City Manager Van Milligan, City Council members, and City staff. My name is Julie Frommelt, and I am the owner of Wulu Incorporated at 1685 Central Avenue. My family has, and their business has been on that corner for about 95 years in one form or another. So I just wanted to be here to talk a little bit about the Green Alley project that is finally coming to my back door. We've seen the neighborhood change in a lot of different ways over those 95 years. We've seen the waters rushing down 17th Street and into our plant, and we've seen how some of the Bee Branch uh, activities has alleviate, alleviated that concern. Um, so I've been really excited by what the council and everybody has been doing with regards to the Central Avenue corridor, as well as all the Bee Branch activities. So I just wanted to say thank you for um, taking a look again at my alley. It's been up and down the last, it's been on and off budgets and pre-pandemic, post-pandemic for probably the last 10 years. So I'm excited that I'm finally gonna get my alley redone, which will help the drainage and also a lot of issues with safety and our forklift, just unloading pallets and things like that into the plant. So again, just wanted to say thank you and I appreciate your time and your work and effort on everything that you've done today. Thank you, Julie, for your comments. Any others this evening? Good evening. Mayor and city council members. My name is Paul Schultz. I reside in the Mount Carmel Bluffs neighborhood in apartment 387 in Dubuque. I'm here again tonight to advocate for your support and leadership in order to continue, sustain, and eventually expand our first in Iowa municipal curbside collection of food scraps and co-composting at the DMA SWA compost facility. The city should continue our collection program currently used by more than 500 city customers and Holy Family Schools. However, DMA SWA, which is 100% managed by city staff, will need to commit to apply to operate a permitted compost facility during next month, October 2023. Or this co-composting program and collection program will be shut down with a cease and desist order. I've spoken to the DNR regulators. I've seen the paperwork. This is a real challenge coming at this later date. Now, for background, our 15-year-old curbside scrap pro collection program is one of the first 25 programs in the United States. Also, there are now 200 full-scale co-composting programs in the U.S. using food residuals. This is a greatly expanding activity and with many good benefits, one of which of these programs is in Iowa City and I plan to visit there and with others to see how they do it so that we may be able to um, learn some things there. 
Uh, residential food scrap composting is more cost effective and delivers more climate and economic and, and ecological benefits. I'm sorry, I just had laser surgery and so I can't really do well with these glasses until I can get some prescription lenses here. Um, climate and economic. Um, more climate and ecological benefits than the same weight of normal curbside recycling materials. Now this is not probably understood by many people. I'm saying that what a household, if it is fully composting food scraps and residuals, what they would set out is going to have more, is more cost effective to manage it and it is going to bring more ecological and climate benefits. And I'd be glad to go into detail on this, you know, on this aspect. My daughter is also sending me some of the academic articles since she's a climate sequestration specialist. Now, there's also 25,000 tons of wasted food are landfilled in our land, in our landfill from coming from Dubuque County every year, 25,000 tons. 17% of Dubuque's trash collection is loose wasted food and food scraps. Under the past I, IDNR, Iowa Department of Natural Resources, we have been extremely constrained in allowing more food scrap collection subscribers and tonnage diverted from composting. It's, the nature of the rule of the allowing uh, food scraps to be used at our composting facility. Only 104 tons of food scraps per year were allowed for composting. That was the max in the old system. That's 5% of the total food scraps collected in city trash. It's only collecting 5% right now. It's just a drop in the bucket but it's because it's been constrained by the limits that we were operating under. We can greatly expand our customer base in diverted tonnage once we can operate in a permitted facility. Those tonnage and limits and what we can include and we write a plan, those, those are what would be able to happen if we were in a permitted facility. It opens it up. But there's more, you know, some more restrictions in it, yes. And some more cost in it, yes. So bringing you back to what I, I and other citizens who have particularly participated in the Climate Action Plan and the Imagine Dubuque 2037, as well as in the August strategic planning, under the environmental pillar in that strategic planning last month, the highest ranked outcome was to reduce waste and increase diversion, recycling, and composting opportunities. Number one, that had six out of your seven votes. The highest ranked issue under short-term challenges and opportunities was Addressing food waste disposal issues. Now this is what you said to each other and I was there to hear it. So this is what should be able to be operated on by this in this challenging period. Now for a little more background and then I'm done. Commitment to expanding food scrap diversion into composting is a priority in our comprehensive plan. Imagine Dubuque 2037, improve backyard and curbside composting. I'm quoting, expand programs to reduce, reuse, and recycle, including composting. Work cl closely with DMA, SWA, and interested organizations to expand composting. Develop waste reduction strategies in the climate action plan, such as food scrap composting. These are exact quotes, and these are the comprehensive plan. So, you are overseeing that the comprehensive plan is at least being considered. There may be reasons not to, but in general, they should be being considered at some level. 
Finally, in terms of the Dubuque Climate Action Plan, under the solid waste and recycling sector, goal number one, 50% landfill <coughs> diversion of recyclables and co compostables by 2030. That means that anything that was recyclable or compostables should be reduced in half from what currently is going in. The strategy, number one, 50% food waste reduction and diversion. City Council role, these are quotes from the document, request DMA SWA to review food waste handling capacities and permitting limits and expand update as needed to support food waste diversion and organics collection increases. This is said to be for the city council and for city staff role. Assess the feasibility of establishing a permitted facility to compost or anaerobically digest organic materials and food waste. This is a quote. So if this isn't happening, I as a citizen and as former resource management coordinator want to know what is being done this way. And, and I'm willing to help and participate. I've been a certified compost operator. I've taught in the compost school. I've been composting, I'm not exaggerating, for 50 years, 50. So I'm confident that the city and DMA SWA can overcome the current challenge in getting a permitted facility and then continue to collect and process materials from our customers as we move forward, improving operations and planning for further expansion. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for your comments. Anyone else this evening? Seeing no one else here, any virtual comments tonight? There are not. Thank you. And city clerks, all right, thank you very much. With that, we can move on to action items, please, Trish. Action item number one is City of Dubuque Park and Recreational Facility Naming Policy Review. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. I move to receive and file and discuss with council. Second by Farber. Got a motion by Roussel and the second by Farber. I don't believe we have a memo necessarily from the city manager on this, so we'll just bring it directly to us. Um, so obviously, uh, to set the stage, I think we all know where we are. We, uh, we did rename a park. The process um, in the end became a bit clunky, and I'll be fully, fully the first one to admit that um, because we kind of, or we, we went against what the commission had decided to do and the commission wrote us a letter, a very thoughtful one, and I, I thank them for writing this letter, um, to say that they thought they were following the process and that we, uh, uh, we obviously did something different at the end, and they would like some clarification if we would like the process to change. So we've all had a chance to think about this a little bit. I think I'll just open the table up to see what kind of discussion we have. Ms. Roussel, go ahead. Thanks. Well, I was also a little disappointed with the process. So we gave our commission a request, and they followed our instructions. But I felt that if, if we had some specific recommendations or ideas in our head about the re renaming, we should have clearly identified that up front to the commission so they could co uh, incorporate that into their process. I feel that we don't want a recommendation to come to us and then say that we had more information that, that and then use that as a reason to overrule. To me, it seemed like not good planning and, and, and not a good reason to reject their recommendation. Um, especially since it was based on citizen input without the fact that we didn't tell them up front that this was something that was really important to us. So I think the results of this process leave a long-term legacy for the park that's involved. And I understand it's possible that sometimes there might be concerns with something that could come to us, but um, I feel like we should add some kind of clarifying steps on why or when we could overrule or uh, uh, just a, a process for revisiting when when that happens. Um, 
I would feel more comfortable mm -hmm. in the future with that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor? Yeah, Ms. Farber, go ahead. So I kind of look at, I think what um, Council Member Roussel is saying is kind of like an opening and a closing for the council. In other words, we could have perhaps an opening statement or a policy that indicates um, perhaps we would like to give some guidance or some additional uh, food for thought. Uh, and then on the closing aspect of it in the final review that we would potentially um, be able to summarize that as well with additional thought if necessary. So perhaps, you know, very simply, uh, we could just do something up front and then at the end to um, make sure that the communication is more complete and uh, more open for conversation and for collaboration. Mr. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, Mr. Jones. I thought it worked perfectly. I thought the Park and Rec Commission did exactly what we asked them to do. They worked hard, they brought us a recommendation. Um, at some point, somehow, a connection wasn't made with the Sister City Commission yeah. that uh, had a lot to say about it, but came to the table late. And uh, I thought they were right. And I thought that uh, we, were, we were all very disappointed to unname the park after our former Sister City Piatigorsk and had that relationship because we, we didn't feel, or at least I didn't feel, that, uh, that the Russian-Ukraine situation was anything to do with the people of Piatigorsk, that they were just along for the ride and maybe they didn't want to go, but they didn't have a choice. Um, but the response we got back from their city government was pretty negative, so we made the correct choice to, to end that relationship. But it certainly didn't end the importance of international relationships for the city of Dubuque. And that information was coming to us hard, hard and heavy from uh, the stakeholders uh, directly involved in the, in the sister city operations. And for whatever reason, it wasn't on their table. So they did exactly what we asked them to do. They did it correctly. They did it. I didn't have any complaints or concerns with their work. I was very proud of their work. I disagreed with their result based on additional information I had that I don't think they fully had. And even if I didn't, it's the city council's job to name parks by law. We asked for some help and guidance, um, which is also under the, the statutes of the city. And they did exactly what they were supposed to do. They did it honorably and well. And we didn't choose to agree with the result. That doesn't mean the process was flawed. It just means that it worked. And it didn't work the way they hoped, didn't have the outcome that they had hoped. Doesn't mean they did anything wrong. Doesn't mean anybody was bad. It doesn't mean any. Anything negative means that the city council did their job and named the park the way that they thought it should be. And the Park and Rec Commission will likely be involved in naming the next one and likely will have all the information on the table and will agree. Um, this was just a, an odd set of circumstances and frankly some late arriving information coming to the council table um, where we had to weigh the importance of their recommendation against um, our long history of international relationships with other communities around the world and the importance of hanging on to those at this time when everything is so fragile in international relationships. So I, I felt that we landed in the best possible place and I certainly apologize to everybody on the Park and Rec Commission, all the citizens that, that uh, responded to their surveys. Everybody was doing well and doing the right thing. It just came out different. It came out for our best, I think. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Mr. Resnick. Yes, thank you very much. Well, um, we are not the only representatives of the people of Dubuque City Council. The Parks Commission were the better decision makers in this matter. My question is, how is the new policy different than the old policy? Do we have a, a comparison between the two? I don't think we have a new policy in front of us here. This is the old policy. So this, this is the policy. The, the question is, do we want to change the policy? Is that correct? Am I, am I wrong in saying that? Marie Ware would like to step up to the podium. Gotcha. Good evening. Marie Ware, Leisure Services Director. Um, the Attached to your agenda items, the um, attachment that says Park Naming Policy 12-3-2018, that is the last policy that you um, uh, passed. 
And then um, because this was a renaming and the policy is naming, then the other attachment is the memo about a suggested process that mirrored mm -hmm. the naming because it was a renaming. Um, so the current policy that is on the books right now that you passed is the one that was in 2018. So if you wanted to make any changes, that would be the policy that you would change. Otherwise, this policy would stand. And this would be like if, and we actually do have two parks that are going to be coming up that we'll be naming because they're right now just called by their subdivision. We haven't actually gone through the process. So this is timely because that's going to be coming up. Thank you that for the help? information. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ms. Weffel. I take pause in the idea of changing a process especially in the way that the vote came out, because it, it was not at all a unanimous vote that evening. Um, in fact, if I remember, we had a pretty robust discussion about it. And so I, I personally uh, would feel that I'd prefer to continue to work within this process as it sits. I, I did not, I voted to endorse the commission's recommendation, and I don't say that with judgment, that was simply my vote. But in a situation in which maybe we unanimously did something, to me that would call for more of a policy change or a, a recommendation change on, on how we do this in the future, but we were pretty split on it. We, we had a lot of discussion on it. And so I would prefer to leave the policy as is personally, but I'd be interested to know what others feel. Yeah, Mr. Schmidt, go ahead. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, reading the last sentence of it, um, at the, subs it's been a long day. At the public meeting, the city council may consider the recommendation of the commission and leisure services manager in reaching a final decision concerning the request. So I think we kind of followed the mm -hmm. current policy. We, yes, like it, like Ms. Wessel said, um, we didn't all agree. We considered it, and we may consider the next naming of mm -hmm. the parks. I like the policy of how it talks about historic people, places, events, individuals living or non-living, major donations of land or contributors uh, of the improvements, the location in such, in naming the relationship to an adjacent street. Those are all kind of things that I think about when, when you name anything after anybody. So I, I like how the current policy sits. So thank you. So I hear what everybody's saying, and I, and I think they're good points. Mm -hmm. um, the process did work, but the process left everybody pretty frustrated. So I'm thinking that the process might use a little bit of a facelift at least, just a little bit. And I have a suggestion because one of the things that struck me as we, as we went through this was, I mean, and I think I asked this, you know, and sorry, Marie, I might make you get up again, but if, <laughs> when's the last time a park was renamed? It was a long time ago, wasn't it? Like until we took a name away and renamed it. Do you have a recollection in your in your position of that occurring before? So I've been here 13 and a half years, yeah. about. Um, and it's not, ha that this is the only one during my tenure. Yeah. We have named, uh, I think three. Gotcha. In my tenure here. Yep. And we have a couple more coming up and then we're gonna have a couple more after that. So, okay. um, you know, it's been more recent that we've actually done that. That's why we actually, did the naming policy back then. Mm -hmm. But it was also, um, we were also talking about naming and sponsorships of other things. So there's another policy that relates to, you know, naming a whatever it so happens to be, and sure. you have a policy for that too. So they were kind of companion policies. We did the one that's more naming of facilities or, you know, like how much of a donation it takes or mm -hmm. things like that. And then we developed this separate one that was actually specific to parks. Got Mr. It. Mayor? Yeah. Well, Can yeah, we, go ahead, Ms. Farr. What are the parks that were recently named? Because um, of Creekwood and um, Eagle Valley. 
Um, and those are the names. Are, are two of the, yes. And both of them they chose, uh, or they recommended, and then you approved. So Creekwood is on Creekwood Drive, mm -hmm. and Eagle Valley is on Eagle Valley, is it Road? I can't remember. And it's also the subdivision name. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank so you. So that was what was chosen at that time. There's a, another one that was done since I've been here, and I'll have to remember, it's just an open space that we have, and um, the commission recommended naming that after the uh, township that it was in. Hmm. So it was kind of historic to the township that this little open space is. So it's not one that's referred to often because it's just an open space. It's not got park amenities to it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I, you know, I think it could be helpful because there's really nothing in the policy at all that I found that really talks about renaming parks. It talks about naming them, but not renaming them after we've taken a name away. And, and it might be useful, um, if you look at the policy, there's a, a guiding principles in number one, and there's an A, B, C, and D subdivision underneath there. And, and I, think, um, I think it could be useful, potentially, to have an E that says something to the effect of, if a park is being renamed, the commission should take into account the original purpose and intent of the park's most recent name. That's basically what we ended up voting on, and 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 if you do recall that conversation, it was it was a challenging vote, um, and I I remember it well because it landed with me in the middle. So I uh, I think that I think it could be useful to add some sort of language like that that would allow the commission and and residents to take into account that if we're taking a name away, we named somebody named that park that name for a reason. And in this case, it was because of our ties, as Mr. Jones pointed out, our ties for sister cities, and in this case, a particular one. Um, and I think we've learned a lot through that process. But, I, but it also, I think, could be a useful tool to use um, that would help, okay. help residents in the commission and us, in the end, decide uh, what, you know, if, if that's something that we'd want to move forward with. So what are, what are thoughts on that? I'm seeing heads nodding and thumbs sure. upping. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So, Marie, do you have a suggestion or thoughts on this? I mean, I know you'd have to bring it back in front of us to officially right. do that, correct? Yeah. Um, so, um, two different things. Obviously, we can bring something as staff directly back to you. Mm -hmm. On the same token, I could have the commission watch your conversation here, talk about what um, because the policy that you have, they reviewed that and recommended. So mm -hmm. in 2018, before we brought it to you, they reviewed and recommended it to you. It could be the same process where now we take this conversation, have them watch it, as well as then look at, okay, what, what might be a possibility to be able to add to that? Sure. If I remember right, I think in the naming of facilities policy, there might be some wording in there that was used because in the naming of facilities, if you think about um, some individuals that maybe got into um, some nefarious acts or things like that where the building was named after them, they take that off. Mm -hmm. And so I remember when we did that policy, we talked about that. Would we want to have that? So I believe there might even be some language in the other policy that might be appropriate to what you're talking about. Sure. Okay. Um, and I'm not saying nefarious is the only thing, but sure. in right. whatever the renaming issue became. Yeah, there are many reasons for renaming, and this exactly. was this happened to be one of them that we ran into. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and you know sometimes renaming is just people come forward and they'd like to have it be named after a, a very historic person or you know something mm -hmm. like that. So those are things that happen in other cities. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, it looks like we have general agreement here on moving forward with that direction. Does that give you the direction that you need to take yeah. back to the Yeah. I mean, as long as that's okay with everyone, I can take that. Um, we can work with that and bring it back to them and then um, bring it back to you to see if that looks like it or whether we go yeah. back. It, because sometimes we've done that on other issues, too, mm -hmm. um, that are um, sometimes sticky or a little more in-depth. Like when we did the Pets and Parks one, mm -hmm. we were back and forth several times yep. to be able to get what is the right thing. Great. Well, thank you very much for doing that. We appreciate that. And and I, I, I think I speak for all of us, and we, we appreciate this conversation because it is it was a new thing for all of us. We kind of had to 
in a way, we had to muddle our way through it as a community. And mm-hmm. uh, as, as Mr. Jones pointed out, this wasn't something we really enjoyed doing, having to rename this park in this way. So I thank the commission for their work on this. Uh, I'm glad that we, we have them. Um, Mr. Resnick, you made a really good point. You know, we aren't the only ones that represent the, the residents of Dubuque. We have commissioners that do that very well. And, and we do need to hear their voice. And I appreciate them reaching out in this way. Great. Okay. Thank you all very all right. much. Thank you. All right. Well, the motion there was to receive and file. Refer that to council for that discussion. So, Trish, would you call the roll, please? Jones. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Barber. Aye. The motion passes 7 0. Action item number two is City of Dubuque COVID 19 After Action Report Summary. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Jones. We would receive and file and see the presentation. Second. We got a motion by Jones, second by Roussel. I think I'm turning it right over to Mary Rose. It's like old times. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Um, my name is Mary Rose Corrigan, Public Health Director with the Health Services Department. And here tonight to give you an uh, after action review, after action report of the City of Dubuque COVID-19 pandemic operations and, and what we did and what we learned. We all know the ebbs and flows of the virus over um, from 2020 through, you know, the spring of 2023. Um, and just to give you a little bit of a quick update on what's going on today, uh, we know that COVID-19 is no longer a reportable disease, so we are, are relying on um, sentinel respiratory surveillance, and that is coming from the Iowa Health and Human Services Department. And they um, give reports regularly on hospitalization admissions, emergency department visits, deaths, um, test positivity by geographic area, and that's through Sentinel monitoring, um, only certain sites reporting that tests um, p- positivities, vaccinations, and this is all summarized in our Iowa weekly uh, surveillance report. So right now, in Iowa, of those Sentinel sites reporting, there's a 15% positivity rate for antigen tests. And although that rate may seem a little alarming, you have to remember it's somewhat skewed in that we're not doing massive screening and um, testing like we were in the early and throughout the pandemic. It's more um, very specific symptom related where the tests are administered. Um, we know that we're dealing with several circulating Omicron subvariants, all of which are fighting to take the lead, quite frankly, and none of which nobody knows is going to be um, the most prominent. Um, our emergency department visits in Iowa, of those, about 2.5% are for COVID-related illness. Statewide, um, as of uh, August 26, we had 98 hospitalizations, and the vaccination rate for Dubuque County um, stands at 64%. So um, let's, let's talk about what we did during the pandemic for city operations. We had a command structure um, in broad categories of planning, finance, logistic, and operations, and you can see the department managers and city staff that were assigned, assigned to those groups and leads of those groups. Um, every, everyone, including um, the city manager and assistant city manager, um, down to city staff, IT, and those various departments. So what were our goals for city operations? Number one, we needed public education regarding COVID-19 and what municipal services were gonna be delivered and how they were gonna be delivered during the pandemic, so that was key. We needed safe workplace guidance and employee safety, and we needed to operationalize department continuity of operations plans, and that was to determine and maintain the most crucial services beyond police and fire and utilities um, that we needed to do. So it, the memo along with this uh, presentation goes into a lot more detail, and I'll give you some of the highlights here, but um, our first area of concentration was response coordination and logistics. And in each area of, each of these four areas, we had strengths and we had challenges. 
So some of the strengths in uh, response coordination and, logis and logistics were our incident <coughs> action plans that were regularly completed in conjunction with the Dubuque County Emergency Management Agency. We also had daily um, departmental, uh, department leadership, department manager and city leadership um, started out as phone calls where information from the county incident management team, and myself and VNA in the county was disseminated along with other departments sharing with how they were doing, what changes they were making. Um, these then in turn in larger departments held daily or frequent departmental meetings to disseminate that information. These briefings became less frequent as the pandemic progressed and eventually um, moved into our weekly department manager meetings and the weekly incident command meetings continued. So in addition to these leadership meetings, a second uh, phone call, at least at first, and later transitioned to a webinar was held to convey information to all city employees. It was daily at noon and believe me, when we did these for the first several months, everybody was tuning in to get the latest and greatest information. Um, this call um, and meeting eventually um, went to three times a week, then once a week, and actually it still continues today to update employees just on general city um, things going on. So regarding challenges, um, the incident action planning and the department meetings were informative, but the two were often confused. And we learned that we need to pay a little bit more attention to our incident action planning meetings because that's where things get documented of who does what, when it happened, what were the problems. Um, we, have a, we have a good track record, but we could have um, aligned those two a little bit better. And so sometimes all these multiple meetings created a little um, confusion. Also, the enforcement of uh, public health countermeasures, you know, our mask um, requirements, business closures from the state proclamations. Um, all of a sudden, there were new rules and laws, but we were, didn't really have details on how to enforce them. And that particularly affected the police department and health department. So, when that happens in the future, we have, we have to kind of spell those out. This is an example, this is our first press briefing, and this was a, a countywide response, but it, it's kind of when the uh, citizens became aware of who was in charge. We, we showed city and county working together, um, elected officials, health officials, and uh, we, we probably needed to disseminate that information to employees a little more clearly. You know, even though we're all supposed to have uh, emergency FEMA and NIMS training, um, we all need reminders. We had, um, the other focus area was workplace modifications. So uh, a lot of workplace modifications. Some, some examples of those kinds of things were the fire department um, assisting with COVID-19 vaccinations and transferring patients. and um, helping with the uh, isolation and quarantine shelter. Um, the city information services department, now the IT department, um, facilitated the internet access and setting all that up at the pod um, vaccination center at the mall and the Grand River Center. The finance department creating different codes um, to account for COVID related emergencies. Our sleeves up campaign where all kinds of di different city staff staffed a phone line for citizens to call in. They also helped with the clinics and um, neighborhood information dissemination campaigns. The, here again, we did have some challenges. Um, although it is not unusual, um, and one of those is around information technology. So it's not unusual for the information services department to create infrastructure for various departments. This is normally done on a much pre-planned process. Um, software needed for vaccination clinics um, would normally be done with a process, determining needs, creating a request for proposal, evaluating it due to the limited number of vendors. Um, and this, this whole process was done in a very compressed time frame. Um, 
the fire department asking to assist with multiple requests that would normally be considered outside the scope of the department proved to be both successful and challenging. And managers and supervisors did not have the tools or processes to track productivity of those working from home, and some departments reported working from home as a disruption. And then also we had to consider maintaining morale and uh, motivation as we were all separated, working remotely, working uh, with much distance between all of us. This is an example of uh, the vaccination clinics at the Grand River Center where a lot of different departments uh, pitched in. Next uh, area of focus was safe workplace guidance and employee safety. Um, this workplace guidance document was created and uh, updated a lot. In, um, that was both a success and a challenge. Um, we were, cr we were um, thinking ahead in terms of our supply purchasing because we knew there were shortages going to be happening, so uh, safety supplies for employees. Um, our field and out-of-office procedures were modified. For instance, um, the police department didn't do all of their um, requests for service in person. They often made phone calls to problem solve and help citizens. When the fire department was called, the uh, communication center uh, questioned employees about the nature of the call if there were people at that household with COVID-19 symptoms. Um, the city attorney's office regularly had to interpret the uh, state, pro state and federal proclamations and develop public health um, emergency language that um, fit our needs and the citizens of Dubuque. Um, so the interpretation of those disaster proclamations was not something that they ordinarily did. Of course, our alternative um, work arrangements, the good thing about this one was prior to um, the pandemic, the Human Resources Department was exploring alternative work arrangements such as working from home, um, flex scheduling, and all those kinds of things, and then those were um, quickly Im implemented and proved to be very helpful during this time. And human resources also had to um, continually modify policies related to testing, sick leave, other OSHA guidelines. Um, another strength was our virtual meetings somewhat increased productivity and decreased waste, and staff did become proficient with a variety of virtual meeting platforms. Uh, the challenges, um, police and, and fire had numerous challenges in their work, um, workplace practices. Um, for, one th for instance, the police shared space, share space with the county sheriff. Their policies and procedures um, were not consistent with each other, so that made it a little bit, a bit hard in the same building. Um, the fire department's close physical proxim proxim proximity when they work in their firehouses and having to mask all the time, including when they were sleeping. That was challenging. Along with um, fire, they're not only fire department, they're healthcare. And so they have to look at the proclamations, the CDC guidance, OSHA guidance, and other um, healthcare related guidance, often which was conflicting and um, sometimes difficult to interpret. And also the division between non-essential and essential employees and their different work environments was challenging from a departmental work production standpoint and from an employee health and safety standpoint. Um, and human resources did a great job uh, along with our, um, the planning committee to continually modify those workplace guidances. Um, another challenge was our employee vaccination requirement <laughs> And um, it was challenging in terms of educating the employees to understand the vaccine, its risks and benefits, uh, the confidentiality for creating a system for tracking that, and also interpreting some of the vaccination records um, was challenging. Um, we all know how important public information and outreach you know, was. 
Um, I went over these a few of these in our April um, report on our countywide response, but the city's public information and outreach was um, the envy of other communities, quite frankly, and uh, worked both you know, in terms of community-wide and city-specific operations, and then internally helping with those communications also. And finally, our fourth area of focus is our city continuity of operations. So some of the strengths, um, the city attorney's office and other departments immediately began um, implementing flexible work arrangements, social distancing, and um, we had to evaluate how city functions could be maintained remotely while still adhering to state law and regarding transparency. Um, information services took measures to ensure the city employees had the technology and functionality to re work remotely. Approximately 180 um, computers we had that were outdated were redeployed to uh, city staff to work at home. Um, information services had to develop a different kind of system for IT assistance to employees. Um, we had to develop technology and processes for holding public meetings, as you know, remotely and make sure we were compliant. And we had to circumvent the supply shortages, um, you know, order more than higher number usual of supplies. An example of using of our continuity of operations plan was my own department. The health department um, took one of the third tier uh, response things we do in our daily work is nuisance complaints and uh, nuisance enforcement. We gave that over to housing. We just couldn't handle it and, and their department handled it for us. So we were still able to maintain that service, just not done by us. And then the city public information office um, doing uh, information daily for employees in the county. This was not without um, you know, various challenges regarding continuity of operations. Although efforts were being made to uh, develop continuity of operations plans for every city department prior to the pandemic, not all of them were complete. And most, and uh, quite a few departments realized they weren't as detailed as they should be. So um, that's an ongoing process of updating and refining those. Um, the Information Service Department advised that ensuring that all city departments had the resources necessary for working virtually was monumental. And they advised that all it was it's assumed that most people had a computer or internet at home. It was quickly determined that there were many that did not. Um, and we also had security issue for working from home that we had to um, work around. Finance had a lot of challenges regarding going paperless in a, in a sudden um, moment, workarounds, um, logistical mail, bills, checks, transferring those things. And then also just dealing with general misinformation as the general public had to deal with. So what are we going to do with all this information? Um, we have a city preparedness committee, um, which consists of myself, um, Tom Berger, our emergency management coordinator, Jeremy Jensen, police chief, Amy Scheller, fire chief, Mark Murphy, our new environmental sanitarian and public health emergency preparedness planner, and Corey Burbach, assistant city manager. So we are creating an improvement plan based on what we learned in um, during the pandemic. Now, many of these things are already being worked on or, or have been worked on. And in fact, today we had an exercise at the training center involving all um, city leadership and uh, worked through a, a potential event that we had. So we're gonna work on um, developing incident action plans and um, our continue working on our continuity of operations plans. Many incident action plans can be, um, have templates pre-planned, for instance, for some weather events like tornadoes, severe thunderstorms. We know the basic things we always do. Um, it became clear that we also need to help have some plans for healthcare surge capacity um, in terms of either staffing and or facilities. 
Um, reassignment of city employees, um, it, it's something that uh, Human Resources is already working on in conjunction with our Tyler Human Resources system and how we can reassign city employees to assist oper to operations outside their department or normal duties um, during times of extreme need. Um, ensuring that we have processes and procedures for how are we going to enforce um, public health or other emergency specific proclamations, countermeasures, um, disaster um, declarations, those kinds of things. What will we need to include that in our planning? And like I said before, um, pre planning. Um, to work on workplace modifications and our continuity of operations. All of these have a lot of details to them, by the way, but I'm just giving you the, the high level. And communication, one of the things we've learned in several smaller incidents we've worked um, since the pandemic is right off the bat, we need to determine what method of communication we're using with each other, whether it's phones, um, teams, text, whatever it is, and so that all communication occurs in one method. So that, that's going to be a standard procedure we determine in every incident. And um, all of the things that we're working on now and other things outlined in our improvement plan are going to be on the agenda of the preparedness committee. You may be seeing um, items come through. Um, in terms of procedures, budget recommendations, different things like that to ramp up and improve our emergency preparedness planning. And uh, as I said earlier, this presentation and report gave a high level overview of actions, policies, and activities that occurred um, from March 2020 through spring 2023 by the City of Dubuque organization. It does not do justice to the hard work and dedication of city employees and policymakers, including yourself during this time and we, um, the preparedness committee and city management will continue to work on refining and improving our plans and capabilities. And um, on behalf of us all, I'd like to thank the mayor and city council for your support during this historic time. And that's all I have. And by the way, um, last, I believe it was April, um, you asked for a COVID update in October and I'll be um, giving that to you with the latest and greatest news we have at that time. Great. Thank you, Mary Rose. You know, I just what you said there at the end, I think, is is really important in this whole this whole uh, report is that there was so much work that went into this process, not just during the pandemic, but now after. And I think it's really important that you were here to be able to tell the entire community that we are not just going past this and saying, okay, it's done, it's over and done now, we're learning from this. We're learning from what went well and what went not so well and how we can make improvements in the future. So I very much appreciate hearing this report. Any questions or discussion? Ms. Farber. Um, Mary Rose, there's an inordinate number of people that I know that have COVID right now. Um, is there any indication or any general thoughts you might have to share with us in the community about? It seems as though uh, there is an uptick, and that, that is reflected in our weekly, weekly uh, respiratory surveillance report. Um, we have to be reminded that um, the immunity from our vaccinations mm -hmm. and or from having illness is waning. It's not as effective. Um, the new sub-variants emerging um, are evading. Um, some of the vaccine, and sometimes that's a really individualistic response depending on how your immune system sure. and your antibodies work, right, Katie? Um, so it, it can get kind of complicated in that manner. And, um, you know, we don't have all these uh, isolation, distancing, safety precautions in place. Um, what we are experiencing, though, is very few hospitalizations. Um, very few deaths, very few isolation um, or IC intensive care patients. So in that respect, the illness is milder. I think we all know what to do and, and how to test for it. And uh, the same isolation and um, quarantine protocols 
exist. There's been a minor change to them, but uh, it's, you know, stay home five mm -hmm. days at least until your symptoms get better. So um, I think nobody knows for sure what uh, variant is going to emerge as the dominant or more severe variant. The vaccine, a new vaccine is supposed to be out in late September that will cover the variants most prominent right now and hopefully look to the future. And so we'll be doing um, community campaigns for vaccination um, and that'll be our best uh, defense. It, you know, COVID really doesn't have seasonality defined or patterns yet. I think the reason we might see an uptick this time of year or in the winter is uh, schools in session. People are congregating and we're moving, we'll slowly move indoors more, which creates a greater risk of exposure. So still have a lot of unanswered questions and if, um, uh, be leery about predictions you hear at this point because it's, it's really up in the air. All right, well, thank you, and I appreciate the fact that the vaccine will soon become available, uh, and that will be um, available at the drugstores again and think well, right, through your physicians. Well, it will not be um, publicly available for free. Mm -hmm. um, it's up to insurance companies um, to cover it. Um, we know our Vaccine for Children's program will cover it, and most likely um, Medicare, Medicaid kind of services. Um, so it, it will be um, privately um, dispensed and dispersed. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. Ms. Wethel. Has there ever been um, more of an understatement of strengths and challenges than the experience of COVID-19? <laughs> <laughs> um, I really appreciate the update. It made me personally reflect back to on just what our community has done and how well we worked and how we can um, continue to remember what that was like so that we can build working documents so that honestly, even if it's 10 years from now that we encounter something in a similar way, and I hope it is at least that long, if not longer, but you know, Maybe I wouldn't be in the workforce in the same way to mentor people who are younger than me to tell them about the experiences and what we've done. I will tell you that as I swab people now, it's a lot less scary than when I swabbed the first one. And we all have that in a certain way, no matter what your role is right now, whether you um, work as a frontline worker in a grocery store and you had to do that during a pandemic or you were working trying to navigate a response process. So. Kudos to the debriefing and to the continuing to say, okay, now how do we remember what worked, what didn't work? Um, I just think the idea also of things considering healthcare surge capacity for workforce, you know, as a community, that's our responsibility too, to work at creative ways that we could support our local um, uh, institutions of higher learning in creating a workforce of healthcare in which there's an incredible shortage right now. Um, no matter what that healthcare role you would play, what role we can play as a community, our non for profits and private investment and municipality investment in trying to create relationships to nurture those educational programs in our community because those will be the next folks that would need to take care of this. And right now, we don't have enough of those folks. So, um, I, I applaud you and all your efforts then and, and now. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. Just, just a quick commercial here um, from an old guy who likes being alive. Um, there are three vaccines you ought to be seriously considering this fall. Um, of course, COVID, um, influenza that can kill you pretty bad. Um, and a new one, another breakthrough that is kind of an offshoot of all the research with COVID. We've got a vaccine that seems to be viable now for RSV which can be a pretty nasty infection. And I'd much rather have the shot than the illness. And I guess if we didn't learn anything else during COVID, I hope that we learned that if you're gonna be around sick people, if you can put a mask on, maybe you won't be joining them. It's really pretty simple stuff. And the arguments against were pretty far out. Well, it's such a tiny particle that virus, it can go right through a mask. Yeah, it can. But the glob of mucus that it's probably attached to can't. And that's the reality of coughs and sneezes and exhalation. Is germs aren't just flying out here. They're attached to the saliva and fluid cloud that cannot get through a mask. Mr. Resnick. 
All right, thank you. Uh, one of the challenges is, so what did we learn? One thing I didn't see on that list was, um, it's a tough enough job what you did when, when public health is, you know, almost 100% publicly acclaimed as wonderful and thank you very much. And all of a sudden this division, you mentioned the word once, but it was just so much division that you also had to deal with and uh, suspect. And, and because the virus changes and we learn new things and so we have to adapt and change what we, well, you know, what we recommend, people intentionally look at that in a, in a wrong way. And so not only are you doing some fantastic work, but you're kind of under a pressure that you hadn't had before. Uh, at least that maybe maybe you can tell me different. I, you know, um, so th that you know the division didn't help. Uh, people dig in, and uh, and they don't help their cause, and they and they obviously didn't help you. So I want to thank you very much for that. Um, and uh, I heard uh, you know so many times that maybe you did we're denying people freedom or liberty, and in the pledge that we said tonight we said liberty and justice, and public health is a justice issue as far as I'm concerned. Those the public spaces need to be safe for all. That's just, we did what we can, but these political divisions hurt what you were trying to do. Thank you very much for struggling through that. I did uh, listen to a, a Dr. Fauci interview recently, and one of the things that he said that we might wanna reconsider when he was asked about school closings, uh, he said, well, it's important that we have that ability to school, uh, close schools, but maybe, you know, the length of time that they are closed uh, needs to be further scrutinized. And maybe that'll be uh, happen because the past is prologue and we know, you know, you know, something's coming eventually that we have to deal with again. So all the work that you've done, I'm sure, will have a great effect and help our citizens. So thank you for all the twice as challenging, five times as challenging because of the, of the climate here uh, in, the, in the country right now. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. All right, well, thank you very much, Mary Rose. I appreciate that you'll be back again next month, so we'll have more questions for you and you'll have more answers, so we appreciate that, thank at least you. a few. Yeah. All right, well, the motion was to receive and file and uh, hear that presentation. Uh, Trish, would you call the roll, please? Jones. Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Barber? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Action item number three is 2013 through 2025 City Council Goals and Priorities. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. We move to receive and file. Second. Motion by Jones, second by Resnick. Uh, Mike, did you want to read a memo to this one? Sure, thank you. Mm -hmm. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Assistant City Manager Corey Burbach is submitting the City Council affirmed 15-year vision statement and mission statement, identified eight five-year goals for the city, and the also identified top and high priorities for the 2023 to 2025 policy agenda, as well, in, as, well as in progress projects and capital projects for 2023 to 2025. The Mayor and City Council has also identified a list of management in progress and major project items. That list is still being finalized with the facilitator and will be submitted as soon as complete on a future City Council agenda. Thank you, Mike. Well, I know that we had much discussion about the goals and priorities, but we haven't had a chance to have that as publicly, at least in a recorded format like this. So um, just any, I guess we'll open it up for, for any comments or anything like that as we uh, just receive and file these and make sure that they're getting out for everybody to see. Mr. Mayor, I'll, just, oh, sorry. I'll just say what I always say about goal setting, it breaks your heart and you walk away proud mm -hmm. because things that, that were near and dear to you didn't make the final list but the things that did make the final list, I wouldn't, I wouldn't move any of them. It's a great set of goals, and it's a painful process to get there. I'm sure glad we go through it every year, as much as I hate it and love it. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Ms. Wethel. I was just going to mention, um, you know, this really 
is truly a North Star for us. And the process is so invigorating. And I came home and said that to my husband at the end of the three nights, and he kind of looked at me like, what are you? And I said, yeah, you know, it's kind of like the culmination of all the things that my constituents talk to me about, my community tells me they need, and I get to go to bat for it. And even when I don't get it to the top of the list, I still feel really good because I know all of you listened and you did it with open ears and open minds. And even if it doesn't make it past the finish line, we still have great conversation about it and we keep it top of mind moving forward. And so, um, you know, for instance, Central Avenue um, made it to our top, um, top priorities and tonight, Reflective of that is action item number seven, in which we're going to move forward with green alleys in that area that support the infrastructure of that neighborhood in a powerful way, um, something that's been needed for a long time. So um, it works, I guess, as the process, the process works and it's rewarding. And um, I think it's all the more reason for constituents to understand that everything you tell us throughout the year really is put into goal setting. Sometimes I felt like there was a mad dash this year to have people contact us and, you know, just the couple weeks beforehand. And I'm, I'm all ears then too, but know that everything you tell us all along the way is part of this process too. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Farber. So my overall impression was that we were really uh, wonderful stewards of the budget. And um, as you had mentioned in opening statements, Mayor, it was important for us to realize the projects that we have ongoing and then the funding that perhaps may end in a year or two from the federal perspective and that now is the time to be shovel ready or close to being shovel ready and that our planning and that our opportunities for grants and other projects it's now or never and I think that we all really realize how important our infrastructure is and what our municipalities but infrastructure managers so I think that was the um, highlight for me, and I think it was just very um, astute and fiduciary-wise, very responsible. So, and it was a good experience to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, and I'll just I'll just close by saying then that um, you know the it is a challenge to get to this point. I mean, I think it was 130 something we started with as potential priorities that came from us, came from staff, um, and it was challenging to get down to, to 10 this year, but we did it. And one of the things that I'm very proud of in this particular year is how focused we stayed as a council. We did have some good disagreements, and we had some very, very robust discussions about several different items. We got to talk about things that we don't normally talk about, um, alleys being one of them, for an example, um, you know, and, and things that we, um, we made sure we got out on the table so we could at least think about every single possibility. But it, I, I'm, I'm very happy with the way this turned out. Um, and not the least of which is the, the fact that we have a major focus on the foundational aspect of what it is to be a city, and that is our staff. I mean, we have multiple priorities on this list that focus on the city of Dubuque staff. And I think that's really incredibly important right now. Um, we've we talked already tonight about workforce. We've talked frequently about the challenges in finding workers, the challenges in retaining workers, and cities across the country are dealing with this. Cities across Iowa are dealing with this, and we have prioritized this for the city of Dubuque. And I, I'm confident that will bear fruit. I'm confident that we will find some um, very good ways forward. I'm also very confident that it's going to be a hard discussion. We talk about the being good stewards of the budget. Um, we're, we're looking at some major budgetary impacts to become the city that we need to be to be able to do all the rest of this stuff. We are very much on our way there, but we have to, we have to do it. So I, I'm, I'm very happy that we're in this place. We've prioritized these things, and now we can start to get into the, into the weeds and into the really tough discussions in the months ahead. And I know that we're looking forward to that to make sure that we do, do right by the, the whole community here. Well, thank you very much for uh, having this on the agenda here and being able to put this out there. Thank you to our public information office and staff for making sure that this is getting out to everyone so that they can see what our goals and priorities are. And we'll be talking about these in the months ahead. So the motion here is to receive and file. So Trish, would you call the roll, please? Jim Mayer. Aye. Mr. Mayor. Aye. Mr. Mayor. Aye. Mr. Mayor. Aye. Mr. Mayor. Aye. Mr. M
Jones? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Barber? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Action item number four is 2023 Maintenance Dredging Project Award Public Improvement Construction Contract. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Sprank. I motion that we receive and file and adopt the resolution. Second by Wethel. Motion by Sprank, second by Wethel. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Assistant City Engineer Bob Schissel is recommending City Council award the Public Improvement Construction Contract for the 2023 maintenance dredging project to Newt Marine Service in the amount of $493,840 for the adoption of the attached resolution. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Mike. Any discussion? We've had multiple dredging discussions in recent meetings, so I think we've kind of worked our way through this one. All right. The one thing I will say is, Bob, I appreciated you in your memo pointing out the reason why we only got one response to this, and that's that we that's normally the case in our area. We have a, a you know Newt Marine being the the ones that work on most of these projects for us. Um, not entirely uncommon. So I hope nobody feels that that is an uncommon thing as they look at that. All right. Motion here is to receive and file adopt this resolution. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Jones. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Barber? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Action item number five is Eagle Valley Westbrook and English Ridge Subdivision Park Design Development and construct, uh, Construction Management Services RFP update. Mr. Mayor. I'm Ms. Roussel. I move to receive and file. Second by Sprank. Motion by Roussel, second by Sprank. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Leisure Services Manager Murray Ware is providing an update to City Council regarding the Eagle Valley, Westbrook, and English Ridge Subdivision Park Design, Development, and Construction Management Services request for proposal and development process. Thank you, Mike. Any discussion or questions? All right. The update is thorough. We've got it here in our packet, so we appreciate that. Seeing no discussion or questions, motion here is to receive and file. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Jones? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Barber? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Action item number six amending City of Dubuque Code of Ordinances, Title 13. Public Utilities, Chapter 2, Sewer and Sewage Disposal, Article D, Industrial Pretreatment Program, Section 13-2D-10, Fees and Charges. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move to receive and file the communications and further move that the requirement that a proposed ordinance be considered and voted on for passage at two council meetings prior to the meeting at which it is to be finally passed be suspended. Second by Wethel. Motion by Jones, second by Wethel. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Water and Resource Recovery Center Manager William O'Brien is recommending City Council amend the City of Dubuque Code of Ordinances, Title 13, Public Utilities, Chapter 2, Sewers and Sewage Disposal, Article D, Industrial Pretreatment Program, Section 13, 2D 10. The City of Dubuque is making significant improvements to the industrial pretreatment program. Enhancements are essential for ensuring the responsible management of industrial wastewater and protecting the environment. These improvements follow EPA recommendations provided after an audit of the city's industrial pretreatment program. To recover the increased fiscal year 24 pretreatment program administration costs, approximately $150,000, each significant industrial user will be assessed a monthly general pretreatment administration charge that includes a fixed charge based on the number of significant industrial users, plus a monthly volumetric charge based on total monthly discharge volume per significant industrial user. 20% of the additional administrative cost, approximately $30,000, will be recovered through a monthly fixed monthly fee that is evenly divided among all significant industrial users. 
The remaining 80% of the additional administrative cost, approximately $120,000, would be recovered through a variable monthly fee that is assessed each wastewater discharge permit holder in the amount of 14 cents per 100 cubic feet of wastewater discharged. The fee and charge structure development will be a continuous process and should be updated annually, annually to accurately reflect program costs. The city will propose additional modifications to the industrial pretreatment program administrative cost recovery plan during the fiscal year 2025 budgeting process. I concur with the recommendation and respect the request mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Mike. Thanks. Questions or discussion? All right. We knew this was coming based on the audit results. We knew we were going to need to make some changes, and I appreciate staff looking at this so closely to do that. And also, and I noticed in um, Mr. O'Brien's memo, working continually with uh, industrial waste water users that are to be able to figure out a more comprehensive plan for this going forward, too. So that's good. Okay. Motion here is to receive and file. Waive the three readings. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Jones? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Barber? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. And move final consideration and pass it to the ordinance. Second by Wethel. Got a motion by Jones, second by Wethel. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Jones? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Barber? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Action item number Pardon me. Action item number seven is fiscal year 2024 B Branch Green Alley projects. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Farber. I move that we receive and file. Second by Wethel. Motion by Farber, second by Wethel. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. The Mayor and City Council has established redevelopment of the Central Avenue corridor as a priority. I have approved the following three alleys for improvement to Green Alley pavers over the next year. The alley between Central Avenue and White Street from 17th Street to 18th Street. The alley between Central Avenue and Iowa Street from 15th Street to 16th Street. And the alley between Central Avenue and Iowa Street from 16th Street to 17th Street. This is provided for information only. Thank you, Mike. Discussion? Questions? Mr. Mayor. Mr. Spring. Um, I know there are businesses that are looking forward to this and I've been waiting patiently. I like, I also looking forward to this because it's kind of the start of our Central Avenue corridor project. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Spring. Ms. Wethel. There are a lot of alleys that we need to do, but there are only so many resources to do so. And I appreciate that the folks who are business owners and, um, folks that are down on Central Avenue, making that place lively and engaging, and it's the future of our city in so many ways that they are advocating so strongly for what they need from the city. And um, I appreciate that we're able to get it done. So thank you to all the citizens who have been so engaging with me, helping me to understand what needs to be done in that area um, so that I can pass that information on to our administrative team and my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, uh, Ms. Roussel. I wondered if, um, if Mike, if you could reiterate for me, what's exactly involved in the green alley? What, what, will, what will the um, residents be seeing? Sure, so um, we removed the existing alley surface, um, and then also um, we, when appropriate, and in these cases it will be appropriate because of the age of the utilities, um, we replace the uh, water and sanitary sewer utilities that are under those alleys. As a matter of fact, we've done up to this point about 75 alleys through our B Branch Creek restoration project. And the way I, we identified those first 75 was we first did the ones that didn't have utilities under them because it's a lot less expensive and it doesn't impact all the utility customers, uh, their rates. But we're out of those alleys now. so we have to strategically pick which ones we do. So then after we do those uh, utility replacements, and of course that will involve reconnections with 
uh, adjoining property, private property owners, uh, will put down uh, pavers, and they're called uh, permeable pavers, not because the pavers themselves are really permeable, but they have a space that's designed between them by, by the way they're shaped. And in that space is where we put a rock base underneath the uh, pavers, and then there's a rock base between the pavers, and that's what the permeable part of it is. Now, um, one of the things is, and the mayor and council has been consistent on this, just like when we do a street project, these projects are partially accessible. If I remember correctly, it's about 20% of the cost, I think it is, is assessed to the adjoining property owners. So there'll be a whole public process where they'll get noticed and they'll have an opportunity to come and talk to you and you'll have a public hearing and all those things uh, uh, before the actual project happens, hopefully uh, in the spring of uh, 2024. Okay, thank you very much. Well, I mentioned in the last item that we talked a lot about alleys when we had our goals and priorities discussion. And one of the hard truths that we really had to wrestle with was the fact that we just don't have good resources identified to be able to fund projects like this, um, which is difficult for us. I, I literally today on a walk with my dog was stopped by a neighbor asking when they were getting a green alley. And I always get those con those conversations and have to say, I'm sorry, we just, we're working on it. But this is this is really challenging. So, so Mike and Steph, I really appreciate you finding a way to make these projects happen, given the fact that we are focused intently on this area of Central Avenue and this part of downtown right now. I think it is the right move and I'm looking forward to voting for this, or not voting to move it forward because you made that decision, but I'm glad to see that that decision has been made and that we're, we're going forward with it. And we'll continue to look for ways to improve the alleys, which really are kind of roadways for a lot of us uh, throughout the city in the years ahead. All right, motion here is to receive and file. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Jones? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprang? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Cavanaugh? Aye. Barber? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Action item number eight rebuilding America's infrastructure with sustainable and equity, also known as RISE infrastructure planning grant uh, consultant selection. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move to receive and file and approve. Second by Wethel. Get a motion by Jones, second by Wethel. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Assistant City Engineer Bob Schissel is recommending City Council approve the selection of AECOM Technical Services as the professional services consultant to complete the engineering design and NEPA environmental study phase to advance development of the Rebuilding America's Infrastructure with Sustainability and Equity, or RAISE, Infrastructure Planning Grant for the project entitled Building Bridges to Employment and Equity, B2E2. The city was awarded a U.S. Department of Transportation, or USDOT, RAISE Infrastructure Planning Grant, which will provide for the planning and design of a multimodal transportation corridor project for proposed improvements to the Elm Street Corridor, the 16th Street Corridor, the Kerper Boulevard Corridor, Chaplin Schmidt Island Corridor, and the proposed 14th Street Railroad, vehicular and pedestrian overpass bridge project. The RAISE Infrastructure Planning Grant proposes a project entitled Building Bridges to Employment and Equity, or B2E2. Through the grant, the city was awarded $2.28 million in USDOT RAISE planning funds to assist with the planning and design of a multimodal transportation corridor, which will connect vulnerable neighborhoods and low-income residents with economic opportunities, recreational amenities, and key community resources in the Kerper Boulevard Industrial Park on Chaplin Schmidt Island, in downtown Dubuque, and its historic Millwork District, and on the west side of the city via the Downtown Intermodal Transportation Center. The project will also focus on multimodal transportation corridors with complete streets and proposed roundabout intersections along Elm Street and 16th Street corridors. The project would also include the design of an improved pedestrian bike shared use path 
adjacent to the existing 16th Street Piasta Channel Bridge to Chaplin Schmidt Island and strategically plan a roundabout at Captain Sheehy Drive on Chaplin Schmidt Island. On July 5th, 2023, the city issued solicitations for competitive proposals from qualified professional consulting engineering firms or project teams to determine interest and capabilities and two firms responded. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Mike. Any questions or discussion? I get excited every time we talk about this project, every time. Super excited, and I'm really excited to see things moving forward. So this is, this is great. I'm glad we are taking next steps here. Motion is to receive and file and approve. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Jones? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Barber? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Action item number nine is B Branch Stormwater Pumping Station Phase four of the B Branch Watershed Flood Mitigation Project. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. I move to receive and file and adopt the resolution. Second by Sprank. Got a motion by Roussel, second by Sprank. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Civil Engineer Darren Muring is recommending City Council adoption of the attached resolution pledging local matching funds in the amount of $19,012,000 for improvements associated with the B Branch Stormwater Pumping Station Project, Phase 4 of the B Branch Watershed Flood Mitigation Project. I concur with the recommendation and respect the request Mayor and City Council approval. Thank you, Mike. Questions? Discussion? Mr. Mayor. Yeah, Mr. Resnick. Yes. Um, so how many phases do we have of the B Branch Stormwater Project? Darren, that sounds like a question for you. <laughs> And while you're uh, coming up, could you tell me how much the uh, the figure is that our matching is $19 million, and, and what are we getting for our $19 million? Like a $100 million? Uh, sure. Uh, Darren Meering, civil engineer with the engineering department. Um, so your, your first question was, there are 12 phases of the B Branch Watershed Flood Mitigation Project. Um, this is the fourth one. Um, I can rattle through them all if you want, but uh, uh, what this gives us is, um, if you remember this project, we, um, you know, it's, this, is, this project is so important because it's right where the, all the watershed drains in the Mississippi River. So it's kind of like the last place for the water, we have to manage the water. And what we're doing is uh, this replacing a system that's been in place, well, parts of it actually before the flood well levee system were built, uh, you know, right 1974, I think it was finished. And I think the pumps themselves actually predate that. Well, I know they do that. I guess they, I know they predate the flood wall. Um, and Public Works has done an amazing job of keeping them operational over the years. But uh, um, just because of the uh, rainfall patterns that have changed a little bit in the most recent years, um, and also just to have upgraded systems, uh, double the pumping capacity, um, upgraded electrical, a more efficient system, um, it's just time to move forward. So what this funding allows us to do is to close a funding gap that we had uh, when we went out for bid with this project in the spring of 22. Um, and so that this federal grant would help close that funding gap and allow us to move forward with the project. And the, okay, uh, so if the match is $19 million, I'm just wondering what, what we're getting for 19. So the total project cost is 26.7 million, correct? So this will leverage a $7.7 .7 million grant from the Economic Development Administration that the city has applied for, has not received yet, but we had to have, uh, they, ha they wanted proof that if they give the grant, the project's gonna happen and the city's gonna come up with the rest of the money. Now we're gonna look for other sources towards that 19 million, uh, but for now, this is what we have. Is that accurate? Correct. Is this a backup or one of two or, um, you know, the, it's really important that this pump works and, and the pumping works. So uh, do we have, how many are on the job right now? And then is this a backup pump or how does that work? So currently there, it's one pumping facility that has three pumps. It has two uh, 90,000 gallon per minute pumps, which are 
extremely large pumps and very hard to get. So if one of them breaks down, it's not like you can just and there's a six, nine month lead time for something like that. So, um, and there's a smaller 20,000 gallon per minute pump. So about, you know, a little over 200,000 gallons per minute. So we're, the new facility will have four roughly 90,000 gallon per minute pumps. So twice the capacity of what we have today. And do we keep those others just in case or, I mean, they're still working? Um, we would be replacing the whole system. Right. So, um, yeah, they're just, they're inefficient. I mean, they, they function, but they were designed, you know, and installed a long time ago, so they're not very efficient. And, and where they are located wouldn't work with the new facility, um, and so that's why they wouldn't be maintained. So we recycle them and yeah. thank them for their, their service, I guess. Were they installed in the 1950s? Is that? Yep. So they they're yeah. really old. Oh, yeah. I was installed in the 50s. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Compared to a pump, you're pretty young. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Resnick. Mm. Yes. <laughs> Still very efficient, yes. Hmm. Well, Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. I'd Jones. Just like to remind everyone watching and in the room, this is... Uh, this is a critical thing. This is this is all the water that hits the B branch, getting it over the wall when we're buttoned up at flood stage, and uh, people don't realize it. But every raindrop, every every spilled uh, coffee cup onto the pavement during flood conditions, when the flood wall is all buttoned up, ends up there and has to get pumped up and over. It doesn't just flow down the storm sewers into the river. It has to get pumped, and if pumps ain't there, we're, we might as well not have a flood wall. Critically, critically important. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Well, and I also want to add to that that this has been an ongoing discussion. I mean, we've been talking about this for years now uh, for this particular project, and it's been a frustrating one because we thought we had it all ready to go, and then we ended up finding that it was costing a lot more than what we anticipated as prices started to skyrocket. We ended up having to return a grant that we really wanted to use, and now we've applied for a new one. So I think it's incredibly important that we have identified a funding source and can move forward with that. And if we can find something else, that's great. But if not, we need to move forward with this. So thank you very much for your work on it. All right. The motion here is to receive and file and adopt the resolution. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Jones. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Barber? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Action item number 10 is Dubuque awarded the Iowa Thriving Communities designation. Mr. Mayor? Ms. Resnick? I move to receive and file. Second by Farber. Motion by Resnick, second by Farber. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Housing and Community Development Director Alexis Steger is recommending City Council receive and file the attached documentation recognizing the award from the Iowa Finance Authority as a thriving community, clarifying the benefits of the designation and encouraging developers to pursue housing projects in the Central Avenue corridor area. And it's quite frankly, is the perfect example is why I let the experts of the department managers present most of the projects that they work on as opposed to me, because last council meeting when I told you about this, award that we'd received, this designation, which is quite an honor. Um, I misstated exactly the full benefits. I, I thought we got extra points for both low-income housing tax credits and workforce housing tax credit projects, and I thought it was anywhere in the city. And it turns out it's just the Central Avenue corridor, and it's only for workforce housing tax credits. Both great things, but I kind of didn't exaggerate last time, I just was miss, I, I misspoke. Well, we forgive you, Mike. So yeah, thank, thank you, you very much for doing that. And it also spurred us to be able to create this, uh, this fax page and be able to get more information out for people. So I think it is a very good clarification and I found it very helpful. I, I, I'm sorry, I should add one other thing. So tomorrow and Thursday is the annual Iowa Finance Authority Housing Conference. They have hundreds and hundreds of people come every year. It's an exceptional conference. It's in Cedar Rapids this year. And they've invited the 11 cities who've received this designation to make a presentation to the developers who attend this conference. So tomorrow about 10 a.m., Alexis Steger will be making a 
presentation to a room full of developers saying, hey, here's why you want to come to Dubuque and with your project in the Central Avenue corridor. Excellent. That's great news. Thank you. Any other questions or discussion on this? All right. Well, thank you for the information. Motion here is to receive and file. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Jones? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Weppel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Barber? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Action item number 11 is U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development Section 8 Compliance Review. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move to receive and file and approve. Second by. Got a motion by Jones, second by Wethel. Uh, Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Housing and Community Development Director Alexis Steger is recommending City Council receive and file the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development Compliance Monitoring Review and approve the City's response to the findings in the review. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request Mayor and City Council approval. Thank you, Mike. Any questions or discussion? I just want to point out this is, I mean, as far as reviews go, especially from Housing and Urban Development, this was pretty good. We only had two findings. Um, even when the team was here, I remember from the meetings with the Housing and Urban Development folks that they were impressed with how things were going. We had a really simple fix for the second one, as we read here, and then um, working on finding a way to make sure that we're um, uh, approaching the first finding that they had appropriately. So I think it's very, very successful. Thanks for everybody's work on this. All right, motion here is to receive and file and approve. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Jones. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Barber. Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Action item number 12 is sustainable Dubuque quarterly, quarterly work session request. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. I move to receive and file and set the work session for 5 15 on October 16th. Second. Got a motion by Roussel, second by Resnick. That is right before a meeting, so I'm guessing that works for all of us. Excellent. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Jones? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Weppel? Aye. Ru uh, Resnick? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Barber? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Action item number 13 is Spanish testimonial videos for City Life Fall 2023 and Flyer. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. I move to receive and file and watch the videos. Second by Sprank. Got a motion by Roussel, second by Sprank. And I'm going to point out that there are two videos and I'm not going to talk in between them. <laughs> I was hoping somebody would make that motion in Spanish. That's why I was so quiet. <laughs> no, <for so long. laughs> no, you're waiting. You're waiting. Eric, you can go ahead and roll the videos, please. Hola, hola, mi gente. Tengo noticias fantásticas. Sí, Live me. está de regreso y esta vez en español. Y adivinen quién va a ser su anfitrión. Yo, su servidor, Juan Monjarres. City Life es un curso interactivo, divertido y gratis que la ciudad de Dubuque provee para que aprendamos más de cómo nuestro gobierno local funciona. Juntos vamos a comer comida local y vamos a aprender todo sobre los servicios y departamentos que hacen Dubuque un lugar grandioso para vivir. Hace varios años, cuando me mudé a la ciudad de Dubuque, sentí la necesidad de saber cómo el gobierno local funcionaba. Quería saber qué tipo de servicios la ciudad de Dubuque proveía, cómo funcionaban los diferentes departamentos en la ciudad y también cómo los fondos de la ciudad eran distribuidos. Así que por medio de este programa fantástico que se llama City Life. Por medio de City Life aprendí eh, los diferentes eh, servicios y diferentes herramientas que la ciudad de Dubuque provee para mejorar la ciudad y para también hacernos ciudadanos más proactivos. Eh, por esa razón decidí esta vez eh, ser el anfitrión de este nuevo City Life eh, versión en español así que eh, porque quiero ahora compartir este conocimiento que adquirí hace varios años con mis ciudadanos latinos aquí en Dubuque. No te pierdas esta increíble oportunidad de ser parte de City Life. Apunta a la fecha y asegura tu lugar hoy, 
Checa más detalles en la website cityofdubuque.org slash citylife. Mi gente, ya quiero verlos a todos. Esta vez va a ser divertido, informativo y caliente. Not working tonight. Okay. Maybe we stop before the second one here. We can throw this on the next, the next agenda, so we can make sure that everybody in chambers and, and at home for sure can hear this. I do. I will point out. Um, you know, there is a YouTube link on here for everyone to be able to watch this, and this will be put out through all of our social media accounts. But let's try that another night too. Uh, are we going to have the same issue with the next video as well? Let's give it a try. We could give it a try. Okay. So. Um, I'm sorry to have to ask a process question, Karina, but do, can, do we have to go through with this motion or can we just move along? Well, I think you can just uh, adjust it to say receive and file and add to a future agenda. Okay. Ms. Roussel, would you care to make that motion? So moved. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Mr. Second. Sprank will second. Okay. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Jones. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Weppel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Cabanaugh? Aye. Barber? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. So we can try the next one here if you want to move forward with that. Mr. Mayor? Yeah, uh, yes, Ms. Farber. Oh, wait, actually, oh, let's sorry. let Trish read first. Sorry. Sorry, sorry. Action item number 14 is Dubuque Police Department School Resource Officers 2023 2024 video. Ms. Farber. Yes, I um, move to receive and file and hopefully view the video. Second. Motion by Farber, second by Resnick. Eric, we can give this one a try when you're ready. Each one of us strives to be your mentor and your ally. It's not to be the working. person you can come to when you're feeling right. unsafe. So we're gonna we're well. gonna pass on that one too, Eric. In it's not working times, out here. We'll, we'll be there fix to that cope. another night. Uh, Ms. Farber, would you care to amend a motion there to? Uh, so uh, receive and file and watch at a later date and watch at a later date. Okay, we got motion by Farber, second by Resnick. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Yes. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Weffel. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Cavanaugh. Aye. Farber. Motion passes seven zero. Next on the agenda are council member reports. All right. Any reports this evening, uh, Mr. Mayor? Mr. Sprank. Uh, thank you. I had a lovely evening Saturday night. It was a little warm outside um, down at the centrally rooted table or the rooted table event. I think they had almost 420 people there oh, Wow! in uh, Jackson Park. So it was a very lovely evening. Um, met some folks I'd never talked to before, but had a good time otherwise. So thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, Mr. Jones. Uh, a week ago tonight, a few of us were at the Dubuque Racing Association grant reception where a bunch of excited grant recep recipients got their checks and um, they're being held to a new standard now too in the grant application process. The DRA has bought into the, the need of the community to grow and so each of these applicants um, who were successful had to also show how their project um, might help to grow Dubuque, might help to grow the population of the city. So um, that's a big shift in how they provide grants and one to everybody's benefit and uh, sure can't argue with the results. Everybody that took home a check that night had, a, made, had made a very good case on why they should. So it was great to be there. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Any other reports? I know about anybody else, but it sure feels like there's a lot going on right now. I mean, there is no shortage of stuff to do, and I, I know I've had to turn down several things lately because there is just so much action in town. Uh, one thing I didn't hear mentioned was um, in between this meeting and last, we also had the uh, Black Business Expo. So there's a group of um, group of women who have put on a Black Business Expo for a few years now. We uh, I know that uh, city manager is there. I'm as well. I think you joined. We were there. Um, for the uh, Excellence Awards, for the Black Business Expo Excellence Awards on Friday, the 25th of August. And it was great to be able to, to hang out with some uh, great business owners and entrepreneurs and hear the wonderful things that are going on with some small businesses here in the community and see some awards given out to some very, very proud people. So it was it was wonderful, wonderful event to be able to attend. All right. Mr. Mayor, yes. if you don't mind, I think we have the technical problem fixed and we can watch and listen to the video. So we can watch and listen and go ahead and move along? Okay. Yes. All right. Are we okay to, to do that? Do we need to do the whole vote thing again or can we just watch the videos? 
I hate to even ask these <laughs> questions at the end of the at the end of the night. <laughs> I, I don't. I think we've got consensus to watch the videos as opposed Excellent. to de delaying them. So I think you're fine. Love that answer, Krenna. Thank you very much, <laughs> Eric. If we've got it fixed, we can go ahead and roll those first videos in, please. Hola, hola, mi gente. Tengo noticias fantásticas. City Life está de regreso y esta vez en español. Y adivinen quién va a ser su anfitrión. Yo, su servidor, Juan Monjarres. City Life es un curso interactivo, divertido y gratis que la ciudad de Dubuque provee para que aprendamos más de cómo nuestro gobierno local funciona. Juntos vamos a comer comida local y vamos a aprender todo sobre los servicios y departamentos que hacen Dubuque un lugar grandioso para vivir. Hace varios años, cuando me mudé a la ciudad de Dubuque, sentí la necesidad de saber cómo el gobierno local funcionaba. Quería saber qué tipo de servicios la ciudad de Dubuque proveía, cómo funcionaban los diferentes departamentos en la ciudad y también cómo los fondos de la ciudad eran distribuidos. Así que por medio de varios amigos encontré este programa fantástico que se llama City Life. Por medio de City Life aprendí eh, los diferentes eh, servicios y diferentes herramientas que la ciudad de Dubuque provee para mejorar la ciudad y para también a hacernos ciudadanos más proactivos. Eh, por esa razón, decidí esta vez eh, ser el anfitrión de este nuevo City Life, eh, versión en español. Así que, eh, porque quiero ahora compartir este conocimiento que adquirí hace varios años con mis ciudadanos latinos aquí en Dubuque. No te pierdas esta increíble oportunidad de ser parte de City Life. Apunta la fecha y asegura tu lugar hoy. Checa más detalles en la website cityofdubuque.org slash citylife. Mi gente, ya quiero verlos a todos. Esta vez va a ser divertido, informativo y caliente. Hola, ¿estás ansioso para saber más de nuestra ciudad? Bienvenidos, me llamo Luz Elena y esta vez City Life regresa en español. Antes de City Life me sentía confundida de cómo funcionaba nuestra ciudad y quién tomaba las decisiones. Después de City Life me sentí más informada. Ahora me siento con la capacidad de ser una diferencia en nuestra comunidad. No te pierdas esta increíble oportunidad de ser parte de City Life. Regístrate en línea. Wow. Cool. Gracias a Juan y Luis Elena. Those were great. All right, we can go ahead and roll the next one then, please, Eric. Each one of us strives to be your mentor and your ally. To be the person you can come to when you're feeling unsafe or at a loss. In tough times, we will be there to coach you. And to cheer you on through all the others. We are your school resource officers. And we are committed to supporting you in having the best school experience. Hey, Dubuque Community Schools. My name is Bruce Deutsch. I'm a supervising lieutenant for our school resource officer unit. So I've been a lieutenant with the police department for the last five years. I've been an officer for approximately 22 years. I've done everything from investigations to patrol supervisor. I was a 10 year member of our SWAT team. And I also was a field training officer. I chose this path because I love to make relationships with the students and staff. I have family that work in education. I felt like this was a natural fit for me. What I want people to know about me is I'm a pretty funny guy outside of work. I love my family and I love to play golf. I love uh, meeting new people, making friendships with the new students and staff and reestablishing old friendships from the years prior. We hope every day is a great day for students and staff. I'm School Resource Officer Marzetti. I'm originally from Wisconsin. I have been with the Dubuque Police Department for seven years. I chose to become a School Resource Officer because I remember being your age and not having anyone to go to. 
I also love working with children. If free time allows, I love being on the basketball court. I played college basketball and now I love watching it. My favorite players are Steph Curry and Skylar Diggins. Every school year I look forward to working with students and staff and also being a part of some events like staff versus students basketball games. I just want you guys to know, whether you're students or staff, that I'm always here for you. I'm School Resource Officer Brandon Goodentoff, but you can call me Officer Brandon. Sometimes I get asked, what do I do as a School Resource Officer? Well, it's my job to keep school the safe place that it is and to teach you some of my favorite safety lessons. During the school year, don't be surprised if you see me cheering on my favorite football team. Can you guess what that is? No matter what team you cheer for, just know that I will always cheer for you. I'm School Resource Officer Shade Pointer. I chose to become a School Resource Officer because I want to help you achieve your goals inside and outside of the building. What I want you to know about me is I love sports, I love to eat, and I have a hidden skill. Every school year I look forward to getting to know my students. Feel free to always come to me if you ever have any questions, want to chat, or you just want someone to listen to you. I'm School Resource Officer Jason Horner. And I'm also your sixth grade DARE officer with my friend Darren. Every year, me and my friend Darren enjoy seeing all of our students so we can help teach you how to make good choices and be a good citizen. A little spicy unknown fact about me is that every summer, I like to grow thousands of jalapenos in my garden so I can make a lot of different things with them. Every school day, I hope you can make good choices, be the best that you can be, and be a positive leader. I'm School Resource Officer Mark Lorenzen, born and raised here in Dubuque. I went away to college, but came back to Dubuque because I love it so much. I fell into law enforcement kind of accidentally. Um, I went to college to become a teacher, um, and I ended up teaching with the Dubuque Community School District for about four years. I looked into law enforcement because I always thought police officers were, uh, were really cool people when I was a little kid. Now I'm enjoying life working as a police officer in the schools here in Dubuque. Once I settled into my uh, career as a police officer, I, I enjoy other passions of mine. One of those is long endurance races. They've not only been good for my health, but taught me a lot of lessons about life. Just know that I'm somebody you can always come to about anything. It doesn't have to be a problem, uh, it could be advice, it could be whatever you want to talk to me about. Um, and if it's not something I, I can help you out with, we'll definitely tackle it together. I look forward to whatever challenges come uh, to our plate this whole school year, and I look forward to getting to know every one of you even better. Know that you can come to any one of us at any time for anything. Concerns, issues, or something to celebrate. We are ready to be there for it all. So you can focus on school, your friendships, but most importantly, you. That was excellent. I really appreciate our SRO program and the, the officers that serve there. So it was a great video to be able to show everyone who they get to work with. All right, well, we already voted on those two items. We've had council member reports. So I see we have a closed session. Before the yawns set in too much, we're gonna, I'll take a motion on that. I'll move that the city council go into closed session in accordance with chapter 21.5 of the code of Iowa to discuss purchase or sale of real estate. Second. Got a motion by Jones, a second by Resnick this time. For the record, the attorney that the city council will consult with on the issues to be discussed in closed session is city attorney Colonel Brumwell. Trish, would you call the roll, please? Jones? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Weppel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Barber? Aye. Passes 7-0. We are in closed session.